Welcome to What in the Duck Podcast. I'm your host, Oliver Peck. What in the Duck Podcast is proud to be sponsored by Dream Machines of Texas, www.dreammachinesoftexas.com. All your used motorcycle wants and needs all in one place at www.dreammachinesoftexas.com. They have multiple locations with large inventory and get new bikes in every week. Knowledgeable staff with great service and financing and extended warranty options available. They also have a complete service garage so every bike is gone through and brought up to speed before you hit the road. I have bought more than a few bikes from Dream Machines over the years and I could not be more satisfied. I've also had friends from all over the country buy bikes from Dream Machines because they couldn't find a better deal anywhere. You can buy a bike and have it shipped to you anywhere in the U.S. Why buy a brand new bike with that brand new high price? when you can get a like new bike with that dream deal you've been looking for. Go to www.dreammachinesoftexas.com and get a bike and get your ass on the road. All right, everybody. Welcome to another episode of What in the Duck podcast. I am your host, Oliver Peck. And today, a very special, very special uh, guest, good buddy, and my personal friend, favorite current musician, Ben Nichols from the band Lucero. Uh, I'm going to start off by uh, letting you guys know a little bit uh, behind the scenes tip here that we don't, we don't record these intros at the same time that we record the actual interview. So a lot of things kind of change in between the time that we record one or the other. In this sense, we recorded the Ben episode before we went on bike riders tour and now it is after bike riders tour it is also after friday 13th weekend and i am run ragged so my voice is probably different right now i'm sleep deprived and uh and uh a little you know there was a lot of yelling going on in friday 13th a lot of whoop whoop a lot of party a lot of people from out of town and uh let's just say i'm uh I'm wrung out. So uh, that's what you get. I've also changed my facial hair since the, we recorded the Ben episode. So depending on your point of view, I may be more or less handsome now. Uh, but handsome nonetheless, as they say. So Ben Nichols, what a great guy. Lucero, my favorite uh, current band. When I say that, I mean, they're a current band that's still touring, still making albums. Um, Most of my favorite music are no longer still touring and still making albums. I like a lot of music from the past. I love a lot of music from my childhood and a lot of music from the 80s and 90s. Most of what I listen to is 80s and 90s music. And when I say 90s music, I do not mean garbage trash radio shit like Stone Temple Pilots and Pearl Jam and... Guns and Roses and Four Non Blondes and bullshit, you know, none of that stuff. I listened to like, there was actually great music in the 90s. Uh, and it was a lot of punk rock and, uh, you know, a lot of underground alternative music, the Pixies. The Pixies is probably one of my favorite bands. I mean, they did start in the 80s, but they were pretty prevalent in the 90s as well. Uh, but that being said, uh, Lucero been a fan of their music for a long time and then i met ben met the band and just totally obsessed i did a lot of tours with the band became good friends with everybody in the band i tattooed everybody in the band i've actually tattooed every member of the band and every member that ever was a member of the band and i've also been tattooed by every member of the band and, uh, you know, I have this whole party arm attached. That's a whole different topic for another time. But I have this this whole arm is what we call littered with bullshit. Um, and it's just party tats. It's just mostly a lot of drunk friends scribbling on my arm, you know, at the at the end of a late night party, which I highly recommend if you ever get the chance to just get done partying and go back to the tat shop and let the drunkest person there just freehand on your arm. It's, you know, it's, it turned it at first. When you only have a couple of them, 
it kind of looks out of place. But once you get the whole arm done, then it really comes together, really comes together. So going into the bike riders tour, talking about that, Ben Nichols, you know, was decided however many years ago, I think it was probably around 2010 or 11 ish. Uh, ben Nichols decided to just go get on his motorcycle and, and ride, ride a little bit and play a couple of shows. And, um, Basically, the quick version, and I heard about this, and I was like, this is my kind of gig. So the next year, I was able to convince Ben into making it more, you know, doing more of this and letting me accompany him along. And I booked tattoos at tattoo shops along the route, and we rode our motorcycles across many states. Probably did about 10 cities, and I think it was 2012 was the first year. And it literally was the greatest. We we basically dubbed it our vacation that we were also working along the road. But it was a lot of fun. I did a couple tats every day. He played a show every night. And we rode motorcycles from town to town. And the first years, first couple of years, I literally just had all my tattoo gear, strapped on a, tattoo gear strapped on the back of my bike. He had his guitar strapped on the back of his bike. And that was pretty much it. Later years, as it progressed and got more popular, we started like – getting more people with more bikes and strapping more gear on the back of more bikes and had merch. This last few years, we've had a, a merch vehicle and gear vehicle follow us on our bikes, but we still ride our bikes the whole tour. But the bike riders tour has become, you know, definitely my favorite part of the summer and it takes precedence over anything else. <clears throat> Whenever bike riders tour gets booked, we, you never know exactly what time it's going to be, what Ben's availability is going to be. But uh, whatever else I have going on is just out the window, and I'm going on a bike riders tour. And uh, this year, we had an amazing tour. We started in Arkansas, came through Dallas, went to Al went to Lubbock, Albuquerque, Colorado Springs, Denver, left Denver, rode across to, uh, I think it was Lincoln, Nebraska, and then... Lawrence, Kansas, and then St. Louis, and then Nashville. I think I might have missed one city in the middle of there somewhere. But it was about, I think it was 10 or 11 cities. And it was just this big loop that went from Arkansas, Texas, up through Colorado, around Nebraska. And uh, what's that other state up there? And then down through Tennessee, down through Missouri, Tennessee, back to Texas. It was really cool. We got really lucky on the weather. We didn't really get hot. We didn't get rained on. We were getting chased by a few storms where the, it brought the cooler weather in, but we never really got wet. So just perfect. Just ended up being perfect. And uh, all the shows were great. You know, and when you're doing a tour like that, you play a show like almost every night. There's a couple nights off, but, you know, a show on a Monday or a Tuesday night, it's going to be a little bit smaller of a show, but sometimes those smaller shows are almost more fun. Then the shows on Friday and Saturday night, they're going to be bigger venues and a little more crowd. A lot of the shows were sold out, especially on the weekends. And it was just great crowds. And we do a rat. We do a charity raffle. We had sponsors, Simpson motorcycle helmets and white knuckler brand knives. And we gave away shit every night and raised money for a charity called American Corps, which is a charity that helps out veterans. Y'all can check it out. Uh, it's a good deal. And uh, mostly, we just fucking have a lot of fun. And being on the road, your motorcycles with your friends and just partying and doing tattoos and, and playing shows, listening to music. Uh, it's pretty much the greatest thing ever. And we're going to talk about that a little bit in this interview with Ben Nichols. We're going to talk about, uh, you know, it's been a little, it's been whatever, two weeks since we recorded it. So I can't even remember what we talked about. So it's going to be exciting. Uh, if you don't know about Lucero, Good news for you, it's not too late. Their entire music catalog, which is extensive, is readily available on any uh, streaming service. You can actually get their albums in real vinyl and listen to them like we used to in the old days. Um, they have 15 plus albums over the last 20, a little over 20 years. So they've become a pretty prolific band and they're, they're kind of the band that influences a lot of other musicians there's so many bands now that are, have this alt rock country post-punk 
country revisionist movement thing that, you know, the, the American aquarium and the, and the drive by truckers and all these bands that are heavily influenced by Lucero. Um, and Lucero has remained like true with the core fan base. And they, I think it's kind of a good thing that they haven't blown up and gone mainstream because they've, they've stayed more true to their music and it's really cool to see. And there's a lot of people whose favorite band is Lucero and they go to every single Lucero show. And I've been going to Lucero shows for, like I said, probably close to 20 years now. And I see the same people in, in multiple cities. I see the same person in Florida that I saw in Denver. People travel and follow this band um, religiously. And it's, you know, a lot of people say they don't understand it and then they get into it and then, they, and then it becomes their favorite band. So that could be you next. You could be the next Lucero fan. Uh, thanks to me for hooking you, turning you onto it, right? All right. And keep an eye out for next year's bike rider tour. We're going to be riding a motorcycle around the country. We don't know which way we're going next. We've done the East Coast. We've done the West Coast. We've done the North. We've done the South. We've done the Middle. Uh, every year, it's just kind of a crapshoot on wherever ben, Ben's fancy decides which direction he rides. Um, I will say there is some talk about Northwest. Northwest sounds really good. So if we could be up there... Uh, the problem with going Northwest is there's a whole lot of nothing between here and there. So you kind of have to get out there first. You know, you can play maybe one or two shows across a, a couple thousand miles go, getting before you get to Oregon or get to Seattle or get to, get to, you know, Utah or something. So we'll see what happens. I'm looking forward to it. I got a couple of questions to answer real quick before we get onto this, uh, Ben interview. Um, which one of these questions should I do first? I got a short question, a long question. Which one? Let's just pump out this short question real quick. And then uh, we got a question from Andrew Higgs. What do you see the future of Deep Ellum and or Dallas? Or what do you wish for it? Uh, and then at the end, he says, what would you like your legacy to be? Love your shop dearly. Hoping and wishing you the best. Uh, Andrew Higgs. Well, Andrew Higgs, the Deep Ellum question, you know, we, on Bike Cars Tour, we did play a show in Deep Ellum at the Club Dada. It was great. Crowd was awesome. Uh, atmosphere was incredible. Uh, it was just like old school Deep Ellum, but that kind of comes in waves. And depending on what show you go to and what night it is, who knows what Deep Ellum you're going to get because Deep Ellum has gone wild lately. Um, but I've been in Deep Ellum. I've moved. I was living in Deep Ellum in 1991, 1992. I started tattooing late 92 there. And I've been in Deep Ellum ever since. I've seen Deep Ellum do many changes. I've seen Deep Ellum at full capacity. Uh, I've seen Deep Ellum at 40% capacity where every building was for rent and burnout and people were just squatting in it. I've seen it. I've seen it at all the highs and the lows. And it definitely comes in waves and you know, the pandemic did a number on it, put a lot of businesses out of business, but it's, it is bouncing back big right now. I wouldn't necessarily say it's bouncing back in the, in my favorite direction. Um, but I think it's going to even out. I think it's going to, I think it's going to keep doing what it does. It is going to, I, my hopes for Deep Elm is that it remains a mainstay for the alternative. You know, I don't really, I'm not a fan of of the big corporate chains coming in. We did have a subway coming to Deep Elm for a little while. And fortunately, it, that didn't last. Um, you know, I just, I would rather have, you know, a smaller family-owned sandwich shop that makes quality food than some corporate chain that's just pumping out styrofoam garbage. Um, and I would say that across the board for every kind of business in Deep Ellum. I don't really want the, you know, nobody wants the TGI Fridays down there. Nobody wants to fucking, you know, we've had some corporate businesses come in. We've got a Patagonia shop. we got a Fluvog store. But do you really want the Patagonia Fluvog crowd walking around Deep Ellum? Well, 
I don't know how anybody walks around with a flu box. Uh, have you seen them? Do they look comfortable? Do you want to do any walking? Uh, but Deep Ellum is uh, my favorite place in the world. I will say that for sure. Home of Elm Street Tattoo. We've been there for 28 years and we're not going anywhere. And I think the crowd, there's there's a bunch of different crowds down there and there's some some nights that it gets rough and, you know, it's borderline, un, it's, there's been a lot of years where it's borderline unsafe to be down there. There's been a lot of years where they definitely don't want to park your car down there. I mean, for many reasons. You don't want to park your car down there because A, a crackhead's going to break into it and steal some shit out of it. You don't want to park your car down there because some drunk idiot's going to fucking back into it. You don't want to park your car down there because a bunch of drunk teenagers are just going to fucking jump and party on your hood. You don't want to park your car down there because some crazy pe some crazy girl might jump on the roof and start twerking. You know, there's a lot of reasons you might not want to park your car on Deep Ellum on a Friday or Saturday night. So I ride my motorcycle to work every day and park right out front of the shop. But, um, you know, I, I think... I don't even know what the question really is here, but I just, I'm just going to say, I wish the best for deep Elm, and I'm going to continue to be there and try to be a positive part of it. And, uh, like I said, we just had a Friday 13th weekend. It was great. A lot of people, a lot of fun, compl nothing but positivity. And there's a lot of businesses in deep Elm that, are, that are a part of that neighborhood community that are keeping it positive. And I hope, and I just think that it, in the um, over a long course of a long arc, that's going to be the uh, prevailing thing in Deep Ellum. It's just people that love to be there and keeping it positive. As far as the ending of your question, what would you like your legacy to be? Um, I am of the mindset that once I'm dead, I'm dead and gone and I won't know what's going on. So what really happens after I'm dead is not really much of my concern. I'm just going to live my life to the fullest and be the most positive that I can and try to uh, be a positive impact on the people that have, you know, in return for the people that have been a positive Im impact on me. And if, and if the legacy of my life is that, you know, I was able to bring a smile to some people's faces, then I'm happy with that. And maybe you got a cool tat. But the problem with that whole legacy thing is like, you know, I did a tat on somebody and that's cool. And then it's not going to be that long until every tattoo I've done is dust. You know, I mean, you can say, I mean, max, you know, I tattoo somebody when they're 18 to 24, add 60 years onto that. There's no more. No more of my tats in existence. So they're all gone with the wind. Live for the now. Here for a good time, not for a long time. That's what they say. Next question, Miguel Silvia. This might be a little bit of a this might be a little bit of a serious question. It says, is ooh, is Harley Davidson dying? Is Harley Davidson slowly dying? And will Indian make a comeback and a takeover? Uh, and then Miguel says some stuff. The engine on Harley's back in the day was so good. Knuckleheads, pinheads are amazing. But the style of an Indian was iconic. But nowadays, with all the bells and whistles, Indian just kills Harley. Does Harley have a future? Will an electric motorcycle ever be cool? Or would you rather be riding a Goldwing? Well, I'm going to go, the first thing I'm going to say is that no, an electric motorcycle will never be cool. No, the answer is no. Will an electric motorcycle ever be prevalent? Will an electric motorcycle ever be preferred? Will an electric motorcycle ever be a commonplace? Possibly. Will it ever be cool? No. No. The kind of people that want, that care about cool, you know, you have to have taste and style to start with. An electric motorcycle can get you from A to B. 
You can you can get on it and ride down the street. You can feel the wind in your hair much like a real motorcycle. But cool it is not. I see people on all sorts of these electric little do jobs. And yesterday, some people, like a group of three or four people, streamed down the street on these like look like a look like a cross between a mountain bike and a motocross bike, bicycle slash dirt bike motorcycle ish kind of thing with bicycle tires and it's electric and they're all like down the street. And I the 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 first thing I said is those fucking people. They're too fucking lazy to pedal and too fucking lame to get a real motorcycle. Like, if you have an electric bicycle, you're fucking lazy. The whole idea of a bicycle is to pedal and get some sort of movement and exercise and get around. Like, if you want to just get on a bicycle and just not have to pedal you're fucking lazy you're fucking lazy and that's all there is fucking to it it's not cool not saying it's not fun there's a lot of things that may be fun that aren't cool there's a lot of things that taste good that aren't healthy for you there's a lot of things that you may like that are detrimental to your happiness and your health and your well-being um heroin feels great is that the reason to do it Every if heroin makes you feel good, should everyone in the world just do heroin? Well, of course they should because it makes you feel good. Um, so there you go. Electric motorcycles will never be cool. I'm going to touch base on the Indian thing real quick because the thing that bums me out about Indian motorcycles is they were iconic and they were a major motorcycle brand in you know, 60 fucking years ago, they were never as great or they weren't ever, they were never the quality product that a Harley Davidson was. They were like, Harley Davidson was like the small startup company and Indian was like the big corporate company. They did steal a lot of their ingenuity from Harley Davidson. They also... Started com- they started the business in 1901. They, motorci- they made motorcycles for a handful of years. Then you know what they did? They went out of business because they just started to suck. And Harley Davidson's dominated. They did not make an Indian for many, 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 many years. There was no Indian motorcycle. And then I don't know the exact years, <clears throat> but sometime in the 90s, somebody procured the rights to the Indian name. They made a motorcycle with the Indian logo on the side of it, all made out of just aftermarket parts and some, you know, maybe a RevTech motor or what going iron horse motor, whatever they had in it. Uh, and their Indian motorcycle, they made a big comeback. That lasted about 12 minutes. They made 42 bikes. The people that bought them, you know, paid way too much money for them. And then that went out of business. And then someone else procured the name of Indian, made a couple of bikes for a couple. Some years later, someone else tried to make a comeback with Indian. And they made some bikes and then it went out of business. And then years and years later, again, the company Polaris that makes wave runners and jet skis and four wheel, four wheelers and side by sides. They had had a company called Victory Motorcycles. And Victory Motorcycles was trying to compete with Harley Davidson and they tanked horribly. And so then the Polaris company decided, you know, what we can do. We can just buy the name Indian and then plaster Indian all over the side of these victory motorcycle things and redesign the motor to look vintage and put big fenders on them and nice paint jobs. And they do make a quality motorcycle and they call them Indians. And they do, they are great bikes. I know people that have them. Uh, It's a great company. They make a lot of great products. My problem is, is that they have, they advertise all over billboards, Indian motorcycles since 1901. I'm like, no, not since 1901. Since means you started, like when I say Elm Street Tattoo since 1996, that means 
I started in 1996. I tattooed at Elm Street Tattoo the whole of 1996. And then I, and then 90, 1997 came along and I tattooed at Elm Street. And then 1997, 1998, 99, 2000, 2001, 2002, every single goddamn year since 1996, Elm Street fucking tattoo. Any motorcycle since 1901? No. If the billboard said any motorcycle since 1901 to 1942 and then from 1996 to 1997 and then 1999 to 2000 and then 2012 to now, yes. They're missing 40 fucking years in the middle of there. Meanwhile, you got Harley Davidson, greatest motorcycle in the world. Since 1903, every single goddamn year since 1993, Harley Davidson has made a motorcycle and yes, I believe that every single year, those were the best motorcycles of that year. I go to swap meets all over the country. I buy antique motorcycle parts. I love antique Harley Davidsons more than I love modern Harley Davidsons. I'm an antique kind of guy. But you go to swap meet, you see a 1936, 1937, 1938 Harley Davidson for sale. 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 thousand dollars you find parts that go on early harley davidson small parts this big two thousand dollars you see a 1936 indian chief in perfect mint condition seventeen thousand dollars why i had an old man an old friend of mine uh mr old junk greg bolden people in the swap meet no mr old junk and he was the guy that kind of got me into going to a lot of these swap meets. And I learned a lot about motorcycles from him. And I don't know, maybe more than 10 years ago, we're walking around the swap meet and I'm buying some stuff. And there's all this Indian stuff. And I was like, man, you know, I was a little younger. He was a little older. I was like, man, how come this Indian stuff is, you know, so cheap? And Greg goes, because that's what it's worth. Um. They do look cool. Um, and there's a lot of people like Indians. Um, but anyway, is Harley Davidson slowly dying? There is a lot of problems with Harley Davidson right now. And I don't know who could fix it, but I definitely know who can't fix it. And it's the current guy running it. The current guy running it, he may have done a great job selling Puma shoes, but he is doing a piss poor job of representing Harley Davidson. And uh, some of you might have seen all the shit in the press and the maze and the Instagram, like Harley Davidson going woke and whatnot. And uh, people just need to fucking just be commonsensical about it and, you know, do what your customers like. Why would you, uh, you know, so I'm not going to spin down that whole story of like, I think Harley Davidson definitely can then keep going. And the kind of people that there's no other brand, almost no other brand in the world that has so many customers that are loyal to the brand like there are Harley Davidson. And with the current shit going on in the media, the people that own the dealerships are pissed because they're not happy the way the corporate is going. And I know a lot of people that run dealerships and they are getting calls by their customers by the buttload, just complaining and saying, Hey, if this fucker keeps doing this shit, we're not going to fucking buy these fucking new bikes anymore. And, uh, all my friends that are into antique motorcycles, they're just like, yeah, fuck it. We'll just fucking only buy old, old Harley Davidson's now. And I will say this, my big, my big gripe with the current Harley Davidson stance is and this is a problem with a lot of brand, you know, automotive dealers in general. Um, but with Harley Davidson specifically, um, m the majority of Harley Davidson owners have no reason to go to the Harley Davidson dealership because if you own a motor, if you own a Harley Davidson older than ten years old, then they won't even work on it. They don't even sell brake shoes to fit it. They don't even sell anything that goes on that bike. Even the common replacement parts. Um, 
you're lucky if you can get a battery. Um, but you can't get a master cylinder rebuild kit. You can't get a carburetor rebuild kit. The things that Harley Davidson owners need every year to tune up their bike, you cannot get them at the Harley Davidson dealership. And Harley Davidson is having financial problems. But there's at least five or six other companies that produce aftermarket Harley Davidson parts that are making money hand over fist because Harley doesn't produce these products. So a company like V twin is making stuff for your antique Harley and they're going through the roof. They're, they're making millions of dollars a month and Harley is hurting because they're not servicing their customers. Also, there are probably five to 20 motorcycle shops in every single city in America that work on antique Harley Davis, that work on not even antique, but just a, a 15 year old Harley Davidson that the Harley Davidson dealership won't work on. So there you go. You've got all these other businesses cashing in on Harley Davidson when Harley Davidson isn't cashing in on itself. That is, that is a major, that is a major of, you know, you're, you got a hole in your net. You got a huge hole in your net where massive amount of your revenue stream is going to other people. People are buying your product and then spending their money somewhere else just to maintain it. Um, and that's kind of the same model with with all the, you know, with a Dodge, a Cadillac, a Kia, um, you know, or I don't know, Kia didn't make cars 20 years ago. But you buy, you have an old Dodge and you go to a Dodge dealership. They're like, oh, we don't work on, you know, a 50 year old car. You have to go to some other shop that specializes in old cars. And that's just kind of the way of the modern world. But I don't think Harley should follow that model because Harley has such brand loyal people. And if Harley Davidson sold the stuff to maintain your antique Harley Davidson, then that's thousands of people a month in every city that would be going to their Harley dealership to buy the stuff instead of going to an aftermarket company because I would Harley Davidson literally sold the tooling that makes all these old parts to someone else so they could make them. Um, so yeah, massive hole in your, in your revenue stream. So if, if the, if the Puma guy that did so great selling shoes is going to take over Harley and fucking get all woke, I mean, he's going to go broke. Hence the saying, go woke, go broke. Um, I guess that's about it, I guess. I mean, um, in this question, you said, but nowadays with all the bells and whistles, I don't know what bells and whistle, whistles that an Indian has uh, that a Harley doesn't have. I mean, you could buy a brand new top of the line Harley Road Glide that has every goddamn whistle sound you can make. But I do think the price point of Harley Davidson is higher than an Indian. And a lot of people can afford to buy an Indian more than they can buy the top of the line Harley Davidson. Uh, so I love Harley. They are the best bikes. They always, they've always had the best style. And uh, I got my fingers crossed that they're going to get somebody in there that's going to actually care about this country. They're going to get somebody in there that actually cares about the brand. They're going to get somebody in there that actually uh, cares about the customer um, and gives up on this fucking electric motorcycle dream. Because the kind of people that want a Harley Davidson do not want an electric motorcycle. The kind of people that want an electric motorcycle do not want a Harley Davidson. And that's just pretty simple. And I think if your goal is to try to convince people that love Harley Davidson to go electric, you're, it's not going to happen. Uh, and if you're going to try to convince the people that want an electric motorcycle that Harley Davidson is the way to go, that's a hard, that's a, I mean, you're going to have to just make something really fucking cheap and just put your name on something really fucking cheap. Cause the kind of people that want an electric motorcycle, they just want something fucking cheap. They're just lazy. They don't want to pedal. 
and they just want something cheap. So, uh, I give you, my, I wish you my best, guys. Good luck. Uh, good luck with that. I guess that's all I can say. And uh, earlier, I was just talking about keeping it positive. So I hope that wasn't too negative, but sometimes you just got to call it like you see it. And Ben Nichols rides BMW and that's his style. And it's a beautiful motorcycle and uh, it runs great. And he's nowhere near as comfortable as I am on the highway. Um, but he does have a, he does have an aesthetic that is his preferred aesthetic and he does look cool and he has all the gear to go along with it. And uh, if he was so inclined to ride up and down stairs or go off road, then his bike would make a lot more sense. But since we're just going straight on the highway, on smooth paved roads, um, I don't know. He would be more comfortable. And he's even said it. He goes, man, I look over at you going down the road and you've got, you're just relaxing and kicking back and behind this, behind the fairing and just barely, you know, just living the dream. And he's like sitting upright and holding on and shaking. And, and, uh, you know, it's just, you know, he's got a really nice, I think it's a RS 1250. It's really cool. We both have bikes that are red, white, and blue. So it's really cool. But I'm definitely more comfortable. And I'm pretty sure I'm going faster than he is almost all the time. But I think if we switch bikes, I would still be going faster than him. I think uh, I think his bike has the capability of going as fast as mine. I just don't think it does under his control. But uh, so get ready. And uh, we got a great interview with Ben Nichols right now. And also, before I before I shut off, uh, before I skip this portion of the show, um, I've been nodded at and reminded to uh, remind you guys to like, comment, share, subscribe, all the things that you know. You say push all the buttons. I don't know if you actually have a button, but you have a you have a virtual button on your screen that you can push. And you can tap it and you can you can slide it and you can swoosh it and you can you can make it go all over the place. And uh, you can help us out. Like, subscribe, comment, share. And uh, we appreciate it. And also, if you do subscribe, just by the act of subscribing, you are entering yourself um, to win some cool shit from What in the Duck podcast. Because periodically i don't know if it's every month or whatever we are gonna pick a winner out of our subscribers we did a big push we did a promotion at the beginning where everybody could enter the enter to win some shit but now going forward um we are going to be drawing winners out of subscriber list at random and just giving them cool shit maybe you're going to win a free tattoo maybe you're going to win uh a t-shirt maybe you're gonna win a merch pack who knows we're gonna be giving away cool shit to our subscribers uh so all you gotta do it's all you gotta do is just the, the flick of a flick of a finger and you're entered to win so thank you so much guys and uh get ready for ben nichols what in the duck podcast is proud to be sponsored by anchor screen printing anchor screen printing has been printing t-shirts and merch products since 1999 anchor is the place for quality small run items at anchor every print is hand done by people who care about art no mass-produced machine operated printing done here you can email anchor at anchorcustoms at gmail.com to talk about getting something printed for your company brand or shop anchor screen printing also has its own online merch store that sells elm street tattoo cheap thrills heart and hand Party First Safety Maybe merch, and much more. You can check it all out now at anchorscreenprinting.com. All orders at anchorscreenprinting.com, over $35, have quick and free shipping in the continental U.S. So go to anchorscreenprinting.com today and buy some cool shit. Or you can click the link provided in this podcast to shop now.
All right, Ben Nichols, welcome to What in the Duck podcast. Thanks for having me. Glad to have you here. And uh, welcome to the luxurious VIP booth at the Mio Tia's Mexican restaurant. It's gorgeous. Um, we're happy to be here. And uh, man, I feel so lucky to have a podcast that I have like good friends that sure. are interesting to have on a podcast. <laughs> well, I appreciate you including me in that company. Well, cheers. <laughs> cheers, sir. <laughs> I don't know what you're saying. I'm oh, okay. Well, I don't know what you're saying. I'm like, like, is my chest hair coming up through my? <laughs> All right, okay. I was like, what? we're rolling. Uh, we can. You know, we usually don't edit much, so we leave all the we leave <laughs> all think, the leave all the weirds in no, there. I think that's fair. So, um, try not to say um and ah. That's that's that was the hint. I will try that my Audrey best. Was giving me no. I'm, she was giving it to me. Oh, don't gotcha. worry. <laughs> I'm terrible about that. I I go back and watch old interviews, and it's just oh, it's yeah, it's hard to watch sometimes. But I'll I'll do my best today. Well, that being said, we are <laughs> happy that you're here. Thank and you. And we've got a, a fair amount of things to talk about. Do we? Yeah, there's current events. I guess so. In the Lucero world. Sure, yeah. There's cool, got things coming there's up. There's cool shit going on. We're actually in the midst of Bike Riders Tour right now. And uh, did my mic just do something weird? It did get kind of quieter, didn't it? Yeah. Check, check, check. I'm not in my headphones. No? Check, check, check. I can hear you. Okay, there it is. There it is. Man, it's like this is like a Lucero show, right? It's all right. It's <laughs> usually is, everything goes wrong. It's usually seamless until you get here, and then it's all <laughs> grown apart. Sorts. Exactly. You're welcome. But we do have we have a lot of we have a lot of cool things to talk about. We've got we're in the middle of bike riders tour right now, but by the time people were this bike riders tour will be over. So hope right. y'all hope y'all came out to bike riders show. Hope you enjoyed. It was it. a blast. But we had the first two nights in a row at the Whitewater Tavern. In Little Rock, Arkansas. And that was a blast. Ben's birthday, you just turned 50. 50 years old. And I was like, where would I where would I want to spend my 50th birthday party? And it was, uh, yeah, natural answer. It was the Whitewater Tavern for me. Very cool. Great place to kick off a tour. Yeah. And then, so I just rode from Dallas to Little Rock to turn around to ride right back to Dallas. It was great. <laughs> right, yeah. It's not that bad. Not bad at all. It's beautiful. I had a great time. And uh, no... No really bad weather so far. No, it's been just fine. And the weather's going to be great the whole trip. That's, uh, yeah. Or weather was great the whole trip. It's going to be. Exactly. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, you turned 50 years old, man. How are you feeling? I'm feeling, uh, under the circumstances, I'm feeling just fine. Um, I mean, you're looking pretty fit, pretty gray. Uh, pretty gray. Yeah, pretty gray. But that's been for a while now. Um, the 40s, uh, yeah, got pretty gray. But, eh. I don't worry about it too much. And uh, my wife doesn't seem to care. So well, she looks great. Yeah, she looks a lot better than I do. But um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm comfortable with where I'm at as far as my aging process is going. Well, the difference that I'm noticing in my age, we talked about it right. last night. Uh, all our rowdy friends have settled down. That's the tricky part is, uh, yeah, and a lot of... The Lucero crowd specifically is getting older. Well, and, uh, Lucero has a fan base that is aging with the band. Yeah, so and they're hardcore fans, and they've been with us a long time. Fifteen years ago, it was like a punk rock show. It was nuts. But and now we're it's all like, getting older. Yeah, <laughs> and um, and yeah, and th the younger kids that do come on board aren't quite a. It, they're not quite as crazy as we but were. But they're coming on board at the current state of affairs. Exactly. They're not. Right. They're not coming to see in a 15 year ago Lucero show. They're coming That's to see true a current Lucero show. That's so they're true. blending right in with what's happening now. Man, yeah. It's uh so I'm glad I'm just glad to still be here. Um I'm glad that we're still going and uh and that we can still get away with it and we can still do it. But um ten years ago, if you were here staying the night in Dallas, we would have been raging. We wouldn't have had any sleep. Four or five in the morning. Exactly. Um and last night you went to bed at we like a, 9 p.m. We had a wonderful Mexican meal. It went to bed about 9 p.m. Exactly. Um, and that a lot of that was instigated by Joe Brown, my sound guy. Like he, if you feed him, 
he'll a just lot. go. He'll he just go lot. straight to bed. He eats a lot. He ate the yeah the Elvis Presley memorial combination combo. <laughs> yeah, he had one of everything. <laughs> so hey, yeah, it was pretty good. I got full. I was I was stuffed. It was, I was delicious. Tired. I, was tired. I love coming to Texas because yeah, the it's true. The Mexican food is is better here. I like the Tex Mex. The Tex Mex, I guess, is what I like too. Yeah. The Tex Mex chili on the enchiladas. That's what, that's my, that's the enchilada that I want is the Tex Mex chili. I have, I mean, nothing against Mexico, but I've been to Mexico, but I like the food better in Texas. In Texas. <laughs> I've been to California and they have Mexican food, but I like the food better I, in I, Texas. I hear what you're saying. I, I, I like Texas food. And too. it's probably, you know, what you're used to or what you're conditioned to or, you know, but. Right. And we can't even talk about barbecue because I'll get in trouble. I mean, um, there's great barbecue in a lot of places. A lot of different. places. Uh, Memphis sure. is great. Memphis has its own thing going. Um, but I'm a sucker for Texas brisket. And that you can't get well, in that, Memphis, Well, that's you know? the thing is brisket is the Texas specialty. Ribs are the Memphis specialty. Right. St. Right. Louis has the the pork. And, you know, it's all Yeah, everybody. so it's whatever you like. But yeah, yeah. No, I, and my brothers are down here, of course. And they're down in Austin. So I get to come to Texas a bunch to visit them. And uh, yeah, no, I I gotta, I, I like Texas. I'm glad to be here. We're glad to have you. Thank you. So new, new, new things on the. We're gonna start off with the new shit right, right. out the gate. Okay, sure. You what got, what you are you got, thinking of? You got some new stuff going on. I've some been writing new, some songs, some new projects, new songs, new collaborations. Yeah. A little offshoot from the standard Lucero deal. Yeah. Um. I mean, Lucero's been going strong for quite a while, and we've just been putting out records. You know, every two years, every th three years at the most. Um, for 20 plus years. For 26 years now, I think it's been. And so, yeah, I felt like it was time. I've only done one solo record ever. And that was the last Pill Light in the West record. The one based and on it was a hit. Blood Meridian. A, a hit in Lucero terms. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, people love some it. Some people liked it. <laughs> and that's, so for us, we're like, woo, we got a hit. Um, <laughs> but... It's time to do another solo project. And I had a batch of songs that just kind of fit together. They were mainly acoustic-based songs. And I just heard them in my head as, as this project. And so I decided to keep that kind of separate and make a, a solo record. So I'm working on a solo record. Nothing's been announced yet. No deals have been made. Um, I probably shouldn't even really be talking about it too much. But, but I've it's, been in the it's in the works. I've been playing the songs live. Uh, for the first time, uh, I think I played four, four or five for the very first time ever in public, you know? And so, so yeah, they're starting to get out there in the world and people will start to kind of, you know, get a feel for them before the record is, is recorded. And that's how it was done in the old days. You know, we'd write a song at practice and say, Ooh, let's play that tonight at the show. And we don't do that as much anymore because we don't really practice as much anymore. Now, the shows are the practicing. Um, in the old days, I yeah, mean, by the fifth rehearsed. by the fifth day of tour, you're really dialed in. You're like, yeah, exactly, and so that's fine. But it's been fun trying these new songs out. Uh, but that being said, I've got that Rick Steff thing that I'm doing as well, which is already recorded. That's already recorded. We went in to Southern Groove Studio with Matt Rossbang in Memphis, Tennessee. He's done a few Lucero records with us. Uh, among the Ghosts, uh, When You Found Me, and the last one, um, Should Have Learned By Now. We did all those with Matt Rossbang, and he's a great producer, great engineer. And he was working at uh, Sam Phillips Recording Service. Which is a cool place. Which is super cool. Yeah, you've been in there. And they don't do tours or anything, so it's not a tourist destination. Um, you can only get in there if you're working there, really. So cool in there. But it hasn't changed much since you know the early 60s. And uh, Sam Phillips Studios upstairs, and it's cool. It's just kind of like a, it's almost like a time capsule. Like it got shut down. Totally and time nobody's capsule. Nobody's changed. In there. Yeah, the furniture's mid century and yeah. everything's super cool. And Matt got in there and brought in some new gear and kind of just got it in a working order. And that's when we did Among the Ghosts and we started When You Found Me There. And then he ended up uh, building his own studio from like the ground up. He worked with an architect and had blueprints and he took all the stuff he learned at Sam Phillips because like Sam Phillips had built that building. He had the little bitty studio 
the Sun Studios where Elvis was discovered, which is just a room, you know, and everything was about mic placement. And you put a mic in a different part of the room to get a different sound. And that's how you kind of, you adjust all the mics instead of adjusting knobs in the thing, you adjust all the mics. And so the room really matters. And so when he built Sam Phillips recording service, which is just around the corner from Sun Studios, he built that whole building as a recording studio. So it has like long hallways and even like rooms that look like a cave. Like you walk to the end of the hall and there's just a room and it's like round walls and it's just, and it's a reverb chamber, just kind of a homemade um, reverb chamber. And he's got all these weird now little things that with built in. Now you can do it with a button, but in the old days you had to build a whole building to get these little things. And Matt kind of learned all that and so he built his own studio in Crosstown, uh, just a, just just not too far away. And so we've been working there now, and it's super cool. And uh, so me and Rick, I decided to do, go back and kind of do. And once you build a relationship with a producer and engineer, you kind of like get in a groove with them, just like a band yeah, member. I think so. And and you know Matt's a he's a Memphis guy, and we've known him for a while. He started working at Sun Studios when he was sixteen. And so he's known Rick, he's worked with Rick for years and years and years because Rick will go, Rick's our piano player. And he's recorded with everybody. hundreds of projects with numerous musicians. Exactly. Like if, if somebody's passing through town and they're recording something and they need a piano player, Rick's usually the guy they call. And so Rick's been on tons of records and Matt's produced a lot of those records or engineered a lot of those records. And uh, so they've got a long relationship. And yeah, it made sense when... I decided to do this project, just me and Rick, where we do like an acoustic version of a bunch of Lucero songs and kind of revisit some older songs. Stuff. Yeah, like over 20, I think we recorded 24. And maybe I'll put out on the record, there'll be maybe 20 of them. And uh, do like a double LP. You got five songs per side. Um, and then maybe a few digital bonus tracks. Um, I'm not sure what I'm going to call it yet. It'll be like Ben Nichols and Rick Steff play acoustic Lucero songs or something, something like that. Um, but it's cool to go back and revisit some of these songs that Rick wasn't originally on. You know, he wasn't in the band when these songs were first recorded, but he's got these beautiful piano parts for him now. And I was like, Ooh, I want to go back and kind of capture some of that. And we've never done a Lucero unplugged record of any kind. So, so that's in the works too. And that's, that's, that's in the can. And yeah. one of the things that was interesting, we we're talking about this whole project, you were saying that, you know, there's some songs that go perfect with the piano that Rick's already been on, but the the version that exists on the record now is already so good that you right. didn't do this. You didn't do this particular song because it's this version already is so good. Yeah. So there's older songs that didn't have Rick on them that you're like, oh, I can make a different version. You don't want to just make the same thing over again. Right. And I don't want to. I'm not like trying to replace any of those classic recordings or anything. Um, I just want to present a different take. And, you know, uh, there's a long tradition of unplugged records and acoustic records, and that's kind of what this is. But it's also a chance to, yeah, really showcase Rick and his piano playing. And so, you, yeah, like you said, if the original song, you know, the records where Rick is already in the band, there's some of those songs that are some of my favorites, but they're not on this acoustic record because they feature his piano so well already. And so I kind of wanted songs that have great piano now, but isn't recorded anywhere. And so I wanted to kind of collect those. And I did some of my favorites just because they're my favorites. But I think it's a pretty good mix of old and new. It's a, it should be. It's a great sound. It'll be a good collection of Lucero songs. Yeah. Well, the unplug thing, when that first came out. Right. Like MTV Unplugged. It was so cool. Yeah. You know, and a lot of, you know, a lot of bands that were kind of, past their prime right you know you know just what are you old. implying i'm just saying like no 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 i'm not saying <laughs> i'm just saying it's like it's a good way to to bring bring this thing full circle because sure. i mean like eric clapton came out on the unplugged and it like right blew up and, and that was like the best eric clapton record sure for years right and yeah and because people don't get to hear yeah you 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 don't get to hear the songs in that context very often and a lot of times you know those songs are written originally in a bedroom on an acoustic guitar. And then they get in the studio and they get produced and full band. And then, yeah, it's nice to go back and hear that kind of original 
stripped down version of the songs. Well, you've done this for a long time. I mean, you've played solo acoustic shows throughout yeah, your I career. You, a lot of bands not, don't do that. I guess maybe. I'm not sure. Um, and yeah, I didn't do a lot of solo shows when the, when the band first started. I didn't do any. It was like, I don't know. I would do a few with Corey Brennan. He was around at the time. He kind of started in Memphis um, the same time Lucero did. And so we played a lot of shows together. He would play with Lucero a bunch. And then he, would, he was doing more of a singer-songwriter thing. Um, and he would ask me to play some of those shows. And that was the first time I would do uh, just acoustic guitar and vocals. I, I wasn't confident enough in my guitar playing to really pursue that. I, I need the band backing me up, especially in the old days. I, I wanted the band with me. But I would play some shows with Corey, and but people I slowly love, built up a, a little more confidence with the acoustic people guitar. People love the raw, break, broken It can get down. pretty raw. Oh, it is. Because <laughs> uh, the, the electric guitar, the distortion, it covers up some of the mistakes. It kind of smooths some stuff out. You, don't, you can play two strings with distortion, and it's just epic. But two strings on an acoustic guitar is like, plunk, plunk. And you're like, ugh. You got to have some more skills with the acoustic guitar, and it's, it can be tricky. I mean, smoothness has not been your... That's not what I'm selling. That's not your selling on the acoustic no. tour. It's raw. It's no. raw and acoustic, and, and it, a lot of people, it's, it's some of their favorite stuff. I, 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 I'll buy that. But and yeah. you get, and you, when, you, when you're a fan of a band, and you get to go see just up close, sure. intimate, just sing along with the song, and you, you yeah. know, it's like, it's great. It can be fun, it's for sure. It's the best. No, I have a good time doing it. And then, yeah, so, and so here we are on Bike Riders Tour, where we just ride around on motorcycles and then play acoustic shows every night. And so, yeah, it's, it, it's all fun. And this is like, we were just talking about, there's a, you know, a guy at the show in Little Rock the other night was wearing a shirt from 2016. And we're like, man, 2016 is kind of a long time ago. It doesn't seem like it should be that long ago, but it is. Yeah. But this is probably... We're trying to trying to figure it out. This is probably the tenth. Well, I'm pretty sure 2012 was the first one, and we missed two years that we both went on. And yeah, there might be two years that we didn't. COVID got us one year, and there might have been another year where I was like, "There's one year just I was in a rough relationship, or I was I was doing and the something." Band was, the, the band there, was, there was super no time. busy. Um, but yeah, that sounds about right to me. Ten shows or ten years of bike riders tour, probably insane. Yeah, yeah. We've been doing this for a while. Yeah. <laughs> well, this it's not as rowdy as it used to be, but it's still it still hurts just as much somehow. <laughs> it's still it's still just as rough on my body. Um, even slowing down a little bit. I mean, we're not slowing down that much. We're doing three hundred a lot of tours. We're doing three hundred fifty miles a day on this bike riders tour, and then Lucero keeps plenty busy. So yeah, we're not slowing down too much. Um, and yeah, there's still you know Lucero has always been known as a drinking band. And so there's still whiskey on stage. Not as some of the guys have 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 sobered up and don't drink anymore. Brian Venable hasn't drank in years and years. Yeah, he's doing great. He's doing great. And Rick doesn't drink anymore. And Brian Venable's growing his beard back. I'm not sure. I don't know where you got that information. I'm just saying it. Mm, I'm we'll saying see. it. I'm manifesting the future. <laughs> well, well, hopefully that works for you. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what he's going to do in it. I don't really care too much. You've got a you've got more of a dog in that race than I do. I, I just think it's funny. You miss his beard, huh? I do. He's he's a, he's a good looking man with a beard. Not that he's not good looking now. I'm just saying. <laughs> nah, he's doing great. And yeah, he's uh, no, nah, he's real healthy now. He's managing his his stuff uh, better than I am. I'm just I still eat like a 16 year old kid, but I don't know. I'm all right so far. I go to the doctor now though. So go at least to the doctor. Now. Yeah, they're checking on you know. Blood tests and that kind of <laughs> numbers. Checking it. Numbers. They're checking, checking my stuff. Checking my numbers. Yeah. And everything seems levels. all right so far. Checking your levels. Yeah. So I'm doing. Topping you off. Exactly. I'm going in for more service. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Than I used to. So I'm at least I'm keeping an eye on stuff. No, yeah, feeling all right. Well, Lucero's jamming. They're busy. The, obviously, everybody knows that with 2020 and the, and the pandemic that touring like went to a halt. Yeah. You know, and that was like. A lot of people had a hard time uh, getting back 
right on track and getting back out on the road and y'all just as soon as it was open y'all were back in business yeah i think one of the first big things we did after after the pandemic was we got on the road with morgan morgan wade um and that was a great tour and that was right when she was uh really she was just getting bigger and bigger i mean you called night. it like you said, hey, this girl's about to blow up and pass yeah, like, us. She's about to pass us by. For sure. And every night I was like, this is the last time you're going to see her in a venue <laughs> this small. Um, yeah, it'll be it'll be theaters after this for her. And and she's doing great. But that was a great way to come out of the pandemic and actually get back on the road. Um, yeah, it's tricky, though, still. Like even two years after um, ticket sales in some places, especially aren't quite what they used to be. Some places just bounce back quicker than others. Um, but we're out there still trying. And uh, Well, it's definitely a, a different world for sure. Yeah. Like a lot in, in the way things are dealt with and the, the amount of uh, promotion that's out there and the right. amount of people that are employed by each place, everybody's cut back on stuff. So exactly. it's, there's, there's definitely some setbacks, but the bands that want to, they have nothing else to do, <laughs> which is us. But but yeah. play music or are, are out there for sure. And um, yeah, we have no choice if we want to keep if we want to keep the lights on and the bills paid for everybody. Um, yeah, we have to get out on the road. We're one of those bands that doesn't really get a lot of uh, royalty money. Uh, we're not you don't sell as many records as you used to these days either. Um, with streaming and everything, uh, it's tricky. So most of our income is just what well, you get paid at the end of the night after playing a live show. And so that's what we do. But you have put, if I'm not mistaken, I think you've put every album out on vinyl, at, at least we, in a limited capacity. Yeah, at one point or another, it's, it's tricky keeping them all in print because we do, a couple of them are still on record labels. We've been on seven or eight different record labels. And then we've done some records just completely on our own where we do a distribution deal with 30 Tigers or something and, and put them out on our own imprint. So we've got, we've released records in all sorts of ways. And so, yeah, the ones we put out on our own or the ones that have come back, like we might have vinyl rights to some stuff. Um, and we've got to, if we want to put records out, we've got to pay up front to produce those records, uh, to manufacture those records and then sell them. And then you get into, yeah, you don't want to get stuck with, a thousand copies of whatever melting in the garage um, that you couldn't sell. So it's, yeah, that's the part of the business that we could probably get a little bit better at. But I, I'm, I think it's great that you put it on vinyl because it's at least people, been out there, there. are people that want it. Sure. And you don't, you know, you don't make a million copies. But no. You make so many and you, you, you make enough to sell out right. and hope you don't have a, a stack of them in the garage. A whole bunch. <laughs> but, but yeah, there, we're but, still doing that. There's a lot of bands that still put out vinyl records, and and when I go yeah. to a show and they, if they have vinyl, I get the vinyl. Yeah, that's awesome. It's and cool to have it, and you own it, and it's. I just think that you own, even if you're going to listen to it on Spotify, when right. you're in your car, sure, you still own. You still own. You've got it at the house, and you can go back and look at it, and they just yeah, they the artwork's big, and they just that's the way you collect. That's the way you collect music. I agree. Because if yeah. someone's a collector, I'm a collector, as you know. Uh, you? No. Yes. But you collect, I mean, you don't. Y'all should see the other side. Y'all should see what I'm looking at. <laughs> the rest of this room, it's a huge room, actually. This looks, this is a little tiny alcove, but the rest of the room just piled full of shit. Collections. Just everywhere. There's not a space. There's not a shelf. There's not a table. There's not a anything, not just covered with uh, collectibles. My favorite thing is shit on a shelf. <laughs> shit on a shelf. You got lots of it. So I get I get a shelf and I fill it up with <laughs> shit. <laughs> and then I get too much shit. Gotta buy more shelves. shelves. You get another shelf. Exactly. But then once you get another shelf. You collect shelves. Yes. So you can collect more stuff. You're staying in the shelf room. <laughs> I'm pretty much. Yeah. I, I don't even have a place to set my, my water. <laughs> night. Yeah. <laughs> but no. Yeah. Collecting stuff is great. I, I collect stuff, but not, 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 not as much as you. But I got a few things. Um, but yeah, vinyl, it, yeah, it's, uh, it's cool to have, and it makes you feel like a real band when you, when you're selling records, you know, actual vinyl records. That's like, you're like, oh yeah, this is, we're a rock and roll band. But this last 10 years, it's, it has made a come, I think it's, I don't know if you want to call it a comeback, but. I don't, I read different, you read one article. 20 years ago, like, nobody had vinyl in their sure. table. Yeah. It had CDs, you know, and then once a CD became obsolete, it's. 
you know, once the streaming service came out, CDs aren't as cool of a collection. No, it's not. You know, the album and the, the full size album is is an actual that's an actual an collector's piece. item for yeah, sure. It feels like something real. Yeah. Um, do you still have a do you have boxes of CDs somewhere? Like, oh man. <laughs> so many. I got <laughs> I have all my old CDs. Right. Plus I got other people's that just CDs weren't done, that with, weren't them, done with them. Done with them. Yeah. Get rid of them. And you take them. I got like three thousand CDs from <laughs> Jeff Milburn when he got rid of his CD wow. collection. Wow. Yep. And I haven't even, I don't even know where those are. They're on a shelf somewhere. I They're don't boxed know. up. I don't know where that shelf They're is. They're boxed up. <laughs> I got VHS tapes. I got. I saw some of those upstairs. I got a lot of that. <laughs> got to have your favorite movie on VHS. I've got VHS tapes somewhere. Not a lot anymore. And those might have been, again, like in the garage. And then they kind of, stuff melts in the garage sometimes. When we got the, when I built the movie room, I was like, I got the the guy that was helping me do the thing. I was like, do the connections in the projector and and the, the sound around sound yeah, system we need, I was like, we need a vcr i gotta have a vcr and he's like no you don't i was like i, I have v- i gotta be able to hook this thing up to where i can play <laughs> vhs on this on this projector on a projector wow how long did that take to figure out it's it, i mean actually you just gotta just, just have to get in. a working vhs player that's that could be tricky these and days. then you have the connections that go to the back of the smart sure player all right opens so it's not that option. hard all right no, it wasn't. wasn't hard at all. <laughs> well, you good. could do it. <laughs> I'm all right. Yeah. No, I don't have a, I've never owned a projector, but it seemed pretty cool. We watched that movie last night or the other night. Um, it looked great. I'm pretty, I'm pretty spoiled. I can't with the small screen. I can't. Oh, it's tough. No, I mean, I've got a pretty, I don't know what size TV we have, me and Nina, but it's something pretty big. And it's, I can't imagine going back to a little box. But a lot no. of people watch, just watch movies on their phone. A three inch, four inch movie. That's, Man, I'm. I do it if you I'm can on a get plane the story. If I have to, you can get the story. But if I'm but doing, you're not going to get the movie f- experience, right? I've got like little documentaries that I'll watch on my phone, or like because you can get the, information the great from a, courses from classes. a five inch screen. Yeah, but you're not going to get the cinematic feel no, from a five inch. I don't want to watch an important movie on my phone. No, I want to yeah watch it someplace where you can quality. see it for sure. And I think my brother. I think Jeff would appreciate that. Um, actually wanting to see a movie in a theater or at least on a nice big screen we, with proper sound. We still go to the theater frequently. Yeah, it's great. And I, it's a shame that most people don't. Um, yeah. And it's important. Yeah, that's... Certain movies need to be seen cinematically. I, I mean, agree. They need to be all-encompassing. And it's like selling vinyl records for us is like getting people into a movie theater for Jeff. Um, and Jeff Nichols, my brother... Who you know well. Um, you know him pretty well. Um, I beat him at ping pong. Yeah, and he's serious about ping pong. <laughs> but you guys have two different styles, apparently. I don't know anything about I'm ping gonna, pong. Before I go back to Jeff Nichols' house, I'm going to like, I'm going to go to- You're going to brush up? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to some <laughs> wow. ping pong boot camp so I can- All right, Jeff, you've, you've, you've been warned. I'm going to sh- come in hot. <laughs> yeah, we have a ping pong tournament. Because we every 4th of July- My parents come down from Arkansas and me and all the girls come down and we all meet at Jeff's place in Texas and he's got a ping pong table on the, on the back porch there. And it gets pretty, we have it. We have an official like Nichols family ping pong tournament every year. And there's a plaque actually. I saw the plaque. You see the plaque? And Jadlin. Your name's not on the plaque. My name's never going to be on that plaque. (laughs) (laughs) No. (laughs) And Jadlin's name's on the plaque. But does everybody have to play? Yeah, I play. Izzy played too. Izzy played her first game this year. She's only she's eight, and so but she she played me. She beat me. So yeah, I'm I'm bottom wrong, <laughs> but Izzy beat did me. Did you let her win? Well, maybe I thought I did, but then <laughs> but then everybody's like, "Did you? Did you really?" I'm like, "I doubt let her win." They're like, mm. I don't know. Like, yeah, you can. We'll let you get away with it this year, yeah. but next year she's smoking. Yeah, you. she's just gonna legitimately. Yeah, um, but. I don't know where all this is going. It's it's super fun. Oh, I was, but with Jeff, yeah, Bike Riders Tour. And it doesn't really have necessarily anything to do with the Bike Riders film, except that I play the song Bike Riders on the Bike Riders Tour. And the song Bike Riders was part of the inspiration uh, for the Bike Riders film. Both the song and the film were inspired by Danny Lyon's book, The Bike Riders. Um, but it's kind of crazy how we've been doing this Bike Riders Tour for like you said, 10, 12 years. And then we've been playing this bike rider song since 
nobody's, 20 years. Nobody's darling since 20, 2005 or so. Um, and then finally, Jeff takes it all and um, hooks up with Danny Lyon, and they make this movie. And you see these scenes from the movie kind of come to life that you've been singing about for so long. And yeah, it's just with Jeff's career and then Lucero's stuff and the Bike Riders tour, I don't know. I, I went around a crazy tangent, but it's just cool to see everything kind of come full circle. I love how the opening in the movie literally just play by play is the first verse of the song. It totally is. And, and it's so cool. And you don't, when you watch the movie and the movie ends and then the credits roll and then the Bike Riders song plays, if you listen, it it recaps the It, it the starts first talking like, man, it's literally the opening scene of the movie is the first line of the song. It's pretty cool. I'm wondering... <sighs> Like how how much that song played into the way he told the story. Um, for me, when I was writing the song, I remember, because it's just a bunch of random interviews, and it's not like there's a narrative structure to those interviews. But the song Danny and the movie had the exact same start, so there's exactly. some kind of correlation like, there. There was, at least on a subconscious level, Jeff, I think, had that in the back of his mind, which I think is awesome. Like, I would, I would love seeing, like I said, I love seeing that verse come to life. Um, I've been picturing it in my head for so long and getting to actually go to a movie theater and watch it, especially with, yeah, those actors and stuff and just, man, it looks so good. Um, so that was a, that was like, like time travel, like getting to go back and like see, see it happen. And there's a lot of people that are familiar with this book, motorcycle community people that are so familiar with this book that they just instantly, you know, were enthralled with this movie. And once they right. saw it, it was a lot. I mean, the overwhelming response that I've gotten from people is like, it's a beautiful movie. It looks so cool. And it it's hard to do something justice when you have so much high standard wrapped up it. in it. You've got a lot of emotion wrapped up in it because it's a lot of. Yeah, like it's part of what got me into writing motorcycles. Because there's people ready to hate it the second they heard it was coming out. For oh, sure. What the Hollywood's going to fucking, blah, yep. blah, you know, but then. Every, most of the stuff that I've seen out there, if you're actually a motorcycle rider, you probably like the movie. Like the people, the only people I've seen that have something bad to say about it are usually people that just aren't interested in motorcycles at all and have no idea what any of that is about or what it's like. But if you like motorcycles, you're probably going to, yeah, at least respect what Jeff tried to do with this movie. Well, in my memory, it's been about close to 10 years that this since the concept of him trying to write a screenplay for that book has been around. I mean, yeah, I, he's maybe, been, I could be on or off by a yeah, couple of years. It's but, been floating around in his brain for a long time. Because we talked about cool. it. I mean, I can't remember how long ago, but we all were sitting across the street from Red 7 uh, in Austin, Austin mm -hmm. on a on a tour. And he was at, he was, we all hanging out after the show and we were talking about, he's like, right. He'd been writing the screenplay and we were just like, man, if this movie ever gets made, it's going to be so cool. And he's like, well, right. it's a long shot, blah, blah, blah. And yeah. that was before he had ever like met Danny Lyon and got Danny Lyon to sign off on it. Oh, really? And then, so maybe a year or two later is when he got Danny Lyon to sign off on it, where right. I heard that he did. I think and it was like, man, this might really happen. Yeah. And Jeff was still at that point like, well, well who knows if anybody's going to give us money to make it or not. Exactly. And then how you get it made, because you know how complicated it is with all those bikes and just bikes from that era. Um, and then, yeah, it makes it 10 times as hard to make that movie. But I think... But finding somebody to cough up... Oh, yeah, sure. Many, many, many millions and on your idea... Right. It's so much different than a studio saying, we want to make this new Spider-Man movie. True. We need a director to do it. But Jeff's real good at that. Uh, Jeff's kind of built his career where the studios, uh, if they don't come to him, he's walking in with, uh, he's taking them, you know, a whole package, being the writer and the director and having the screenplay. And he's probably got an actor or two on board. And so he's taking the studios or whoever, the, the people funding the movies. He's usually offering them something that's hard to say no to. Um, just built his career in a certain way where he could actually get away with that. It just, it's because he works so hard and he's really talented. Um, and that with Danny Lyon, like uh, the photographer who, who did the, in, he took all the photos in, in the bike riders and recorded all the interviews. We contacted him because we wanted to use one of the photos for the cover of Nobody's Darlings. 
And I don't know if we emailed him. I think we just emailed him. And he actually got back in touch with us and was like, yeah, you can use one of the photos. And that was amazing. And we should have used one of the photos. But then Brian Vimble's like, uh, it should just be you. Like, people are going to think that's you. So you should just, it should be you on the cover. I'm like, ah. So you made it look like the photo. So we, we interpreted the photo. We did our own version of one of the photos. And it was actually a guy, yeah, leaning on a pool table. And so we reenacted a photo and used that. And um, I don't know. It came out good. And then I'm like, fuck these guys. I, that's what I was. Then I had to email them <laughs> and be like, well, thank you very much for saying yes. Um, we will still pay you the same amount of money, but we've decided to, uh, I don't know. It was a horrible email to have to write, but he was super nice when he wrote back. He's like, ah, he's like, that's cool. He's like, uh, he's like, I actually gave the money to some of the guys that were in the book. Uh, they're still around. And we're like, all right, that's great. Everything worked out. He's like, so, but your brother, I'm like, oh yeah, he's, he's, I don't know what movie Jeff is, was working on at the time, but Danny Lyon knew somehow he knew Jeff was my brother. So I think, Jeff didn't go looking for Danny Lyon. Danny Lyon came looking for Jeff, actually. Oh, that's cool. And was like, I want to I want to turn this book into a, a movie. And it might have worked that way. I might be making that up, but I, I remember something about um, it was almost more Danny Lyon seeking out Jeff Nichols. Yeah. But it, that's cool. it got made, and it's – I'm amazed it got made, and it got it, – man, he did a great job. Well, I mean, that was his – I mean, that's definitely Danny Lyon's biggest con- contribution to the – Publishing well, world is that man, one book. That's the book that most people know him. That's from. probably what he's most famous for. That's what I'm saying. Not, I mean, but, um, he has a, a, he did a, a lot vast of, volume of work. Yeah, a lot of civil rights photography. Like, there's this whole story, uh, and I, I would screw it up if I tried to tell it. But he's got some wild stories from the civil rights days and chronicling um, the marches in the South in the '60s. And um, yeah, he and then he's worked on reservations out west and in some prisons. And so yeah, he's like. He goes out into the world and, yeah, he's he seeks to document serious stuff. But as as far as I mean, it was a I don't know how much people know about the book, but he, for him to dive in deep, and and hang out with this outlaw club for so long, yeah, and become. I did ask definitely him. Definitely an outsider from their world, and he kind of just. He was a college student. Yeah, but then. And I'm not sure. There's a great scene in the movie where Michael Shannon is like ripping on yeah. college college libtards. Yeah, totally. And he's like, "What do you do?" He's like, "I'm a college libtard." You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. it's like, he's pretty... like, "I go to school for photography." <laughs> <laughs> I'm in college. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's and a great scene. I don't know. I'm not sure. Yeah, after all this talk, I'm not sure exactly how he ended up with the club. Um, and. I don't know. I From think my I've, understanding is he was he a wanted guy, to document. He, he's a guy, like you said, he wants to go out and document right. serious things. He wasn't as concerned with being in the club as he was with foot, he photographing wanted, he and documenting to, the club. He knew there was a CD on the world, and right. he wanted to get in and get yeah. behind the scenes photos. But he of became it. a member to in order to document it, in oh, order yeah. to do that. Well, you can't. And he was go, there. You can't just go hang out, right? I wouldn't figure. Nobody rides for free, even you? in those days. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, those photos. Uh, I remember I, I found the book in the bookstore and I picked it up just because some of them, you know, going to punk rock shows in the 90s or whatever. And uh, some of the pictures, they just look like kids that I knew from whatever, you know, music scene. Um, and I was like, ah, these are like people I know, but this photo is from 19, you know, but 68. It's a, t- it's a timeless era. And yeah. It, because those people, there's people today that look just like that. True. Yeah. And that's that's kind of what drew me into it. Um, and then, yeah, those Jeff was always like, man, we can get this movie made if we can, if we just take the book and show the color, like the original was all black and white, but then in a later edition, he added some of these color photos and just the way they, the colors in them, Jeff was like, man, if you can make a movie that looks like this photo, if you just show that to somebody and then kind of lay out the story, he's like, they'll, somebody's going to make this movie. Somebody will fund this movie. Somebody will, will pay to get this made because it, they're just gorgeous. And from my understanding, the way this works is like you you get somebody to sign on and you get a budget and then right. then you go over budget and you need more money and you go over budget and you need more money. <laughs> sure. Usually. <laughs> um, and the tricky part, I think nowadays, what what blows everything out of the out of I don't know, what, what complicates well, things is how much you've got to spend to market everything. So you spend six times what you paid to actually film the movie. 
you spend six times that on marketing or I don't know. I'm making that. I don't know how it's, much you it's a spend, lot, but it's a whole lot. And I know it's yeah. at least at least equal to how much you spend making it. You spend. Yeah, marketing. I think double or triple or yeah, who knows how much. But, but the day I sh the first day I showed up in Cincinnati. Right. Where and they went, filmed. And went to the offices before filming had started. And I went in and sat and was sitting in Jeff's office and we were chatting it up. And he was just like, he's like, man, I'm sweating. I got right. I about I got to make a phone call and ask for more money. Right. Yeah. You know, because sure. you know, they're now now that they've laid out a film schedule and now that they laid out a budget and now that they're like we're coming up short. Actual costs are going to be this. <laughs> yeah. We got to we got yeah. to get some more money. So it's yeah. like that happens a few times. Sure. You know, and you hear, and that's all like But now they've already spent so much money. Right. What are you going to do? Just abandon your 20 million? Or are you going to give another 5 million? Man, you know what, I mean? what are you going to do? Sometimes it gets close. Sometimes <laughs> they're like, yep, yeah, we're just going to abandon it. And you're like, no. But um, yeah, it's, a, it's it could happen. It's happened before. Um, but he had such a great cast. You know, nobody wants to, you know, nobody's going to, nobody wants to pull the plug on Tom Hardy. You know, if you've got Tom Hardy on the film, you're like, Okay, we're gonna make this work. I thought he was great. I thought he was awesome. Yeah, uh, it's. I thought it's a great performance. Um, yeah, he was a he was a perfect Johnny Davis. Uh, but I was blown away, uh, blown away by uh, Jody Jody Comer. She went above and beyond. Um, just in yeah, going back and actually hearing the tapes, the original tapes of Kathy, and then hearing what Jody Comer did, and it's just exactly spot on. She did a great but job. But reading reading the script before. And then mm -hmm. seeing what I saw on set didn't prepare me for what her character was going to be in the movie. Right. You know, then you see it in the movie. And, and the first time, the first time we watched the movie, we're just so busy trying to look at motorcycles and see who's in it. And right. you're not really catching the whole thing. But, sure, you know, the more I watched it a few more times and it just, it just, she, her performance. She's 100% there. Oh, man. Yeah. Nah, and now, cool. I mean, I didn't know who she was. Right. previous but right. I, but other people a lot of people do and a lot of people love her from her previous projects and and people are like crazy about her sure and i now understand why right no i'd seen her in one film before i hadn't seen killing eve although i've watched i've watched some killing eve now uh nina's watching like the whole all the seasons um but yeah uh, yeah people know who she is now for sure um more and more people do and i do and yeah i was really impressed and but i do know a lot of people went to see this movie because she was in it. Yeah. And a lot of people went to see the movie because Tom Hardy's in it. A and then you've got Austin Butler. People went to see the movie because Austin Butler's in it. And those are diff right. three different demographics of people. Sure. You know, all coming to see the same. And movie. then I got it, man. And then Toby Wallace. Nobody uh, knows who he was. He's nobody great. knows, but they will one day, I hope. Because he's like, ah, he's my favorite. And he kind of plays the. The he's villain. the funniest guy in real life, too. I bet he is. I've never, I didn't get to meet him. I didn't get to hang out with him. <laughs> but, uh, I saw that movie Baby Teeth, and he just, ah, I thought he was brilliant. And so when Jeff was like talking about different actors and his name came up, I was like, ah, he would be good. Or actually, I, you know what? I think Jeff actually was like, hey, watch Baby Teeth and tell me what you think about this, this kid. And I was like, ah, oh, he's the real deal. So I can't wait to see what he does in the future. More oh, he's, stuff. He is wild, man. He's so, yeah. funny. And then, yeah, and like we were saying, and a lot of the other actors, I'm going to forget. It. Of course, you got Michael Shannon in there, uh, who's been in all of Jeff's stuff. And I've, he's, he's great, of course. Do you think that Jeff will ever make a movie that doesn't have Mike Shannon in it? That doesn't? Yeah. I doubt it. I hope not. Uh, yeah. It would be weird. It would be weird if he did. But what he wants to do is get back and make something where Mike's like the lead. And so we'll see. I know Jeff always, Jeff always has four or five things that he's working on you know, at any given point. And so, and one of those is like a, is like a Mike Shannon project. So that'll be cool. It'll, yeah. Now Mike, hopefully, hopefully Mike sticks with us. Hopefully Mike will always be around. He's great. Well, Mike did some shit for you too. Yeah. We, that was one of the coolest things Lucero has ever done. Um, Cause we had a song off of the, among the ghosts record called long way back home. And when among the ghosts, when that album was done, it was instantly my favorite Lucero record. And I think still to this day, just as a, as a whole kind of piece of work, all 10 songs work really well together. And I just really like the way it came out. So I sent it to Jeff. The sound of the whole album is, is, is I think it's good. very well put together. And that's the first one we did with Matt Rossbang. Um, 
And that's also the first one where we went into the studio and didn't have anything planned. We just kind of- See what happens. Yeah. And so we'd work for like four or five days, just throwing <laughs> stuff around. And then we'd go on tour for a couple months. And, and that's come the back. influence a, a producer and engineer can have on a, on, a, on a project. While we were gone, he would kind of mix the stuff and mess with it and kind of shape it. And they're like, all right, you had this and it's not really finished, but this is what I did with it. See what you think. And then we're like, ah, oh, we get excited. And then we'd really, yeah, put the song into shape. But um, at the end, I was super happy with the r record. And I was like, we need to shell out some money for a video. And so I finally, like Jeff had been successful. Um, but I finally had something that I was proud enough of to be like, hey, I sent him the whole record. I was like, just pick any song, anything that you like. And if there's one that you could help me and do a video for. What in the Duck podcast is proud to be sponsored by Legacy Inc., the finest in tattoo pigments. I have been using this ink exclusively for over 20 years myself. It has been recently rebranded and marketed, but it has been the same recipe for decades. Real, hand-mixed tattoo pigments that heal great and last. People always comment on the yellow that I use and the yellow tattooed on me. My favorite, the Mayan yellow. I have seen countless 20 plus year old tattoos with the colors still vivid. Don't fuck around with all these newfangled companies with their watered down baloney. Get the tried, true, and tested good shit. You can find them on Instagram at Legacy Pigments or email Ashley today to place an order at legacyartsupplies at gmail.com. Tell them Oliver sent you and receive a special discount. Don't just do tattoos. Be a part of a legacy. And so he liked Long Way Back Home because it was kind of like a story song. It was about three brothers. Um, the well, wait, it's not kind of a story song. It's it is totally a, <laughs> a story song. <laughs> well, the ending is kind of vague, like a, some Jeff Nichols movies, too. Um, so maybe that's why he liked it. Yeah, it's a little open-ended, but it is, yeah, a story song. And so I think he kind of instantly had this vision of Mike and some other actors. Um, and... Yeah, he ended up making a seven or eight minute short film. So cool. With the song kind of in the middle. Uh, and it's a really cool music video short film. And we got, yeah, Michael yeah, Shannon, it's, it's Garrett like Hedlund. It's like story at the beginning. And then they're like, because they're interacting right. with each other. And then the music kind of comes in and yep. takes over. Exactly. Yeah. And then the brothers come in. And the brothers, you've got Michael Shannon as the oldest brother. And then you got Garrett Hedlund and Scoot McNeary. Who, those, both those guys are amazing. And Paul Sparks plays a little part at the beginning too. Um, Paul so Sparks all was, these, he was, that was around the time you were filming that special, right? Man, Close I can't remember. It. Maybe after that, I'm not sure. But uh, yeah, Paul Sparks and Mike were both in, you know, Boardwalk Empire together. And Paul Sparks was in uh, Midnight Special with, yeah, with yeah, Mike I, as I, well. I think it was close around that yeah. same time that, or right after that movie got filmed or something. Yeah, maybe so. But Jeff has been friends with Paul Sparks for a long time and really respects what he does. So yeah. Just the fact that our little band, Lucero, can get and these actors came to Memphis and worked for, yeah, a few days to make this short film for us. Um, yeah, that was, like I said, that's probably the coolest thing that Lucero has ever actually accomplished. <laughs> I was real happy with that. And then there's the story about you had that song where there's like the, the spoken word in the middle of the song. Oh, yeah, and that's you, on the same record. And you were uh, asked Mike if he would if he would read it. Yeah, and back into the night. And so you just, the story you told me is like, I had, a, you know, he said, okay, let me do it. I can do it now or whatever. And you're like, well, I got to write this. So you wrote. Well, what? Yeah, well, what? It was like, it was the last song on the record that didn't have any lyrics. And I was kind of out of lyrics. I had all these little chunks and pieces of words that had gotten edited out of other songs. And they were good. They were all right. One-liners. But they wouldn't, yeah, they didn't fit anywhere else. And they weren't good enough to build a whole song around on their own. But I had these little leftover bits and pieces. And I had this song that was kind of uh, kind of a long, kind of drone. Ominous. Yeah, kind leery. of a slow build. Yeah. And I was like, I wonder if you could just, I kind of had, you know, there's like songs like Jawbreaker's Bivouac. Yeah. Where there's like, a, they sample a movie or something. And there's this, there's this dialogue or these voices in the background, kind of underneath or just above the music. And I was like, ah, oh, maybe we can sample something from a movie. And Jawbreaker did that a lot. At the yeah. live shows, they would play quotes and yeah. spoken word between songs. And, and I was, I, I liked that stuff. And I was like, maybe I can do that. 
But then I was like, I don't, there's no way I can get the rights to any of this like at the last minute. Cause it was like in two days it was going to the mastering guy. And then once it's mastered, yeah, it's, it's done, done. So I needed to get it like by tomorrow. And I was like, I wonder if I can make this happen. So I called Jeff and Jeff calls Mike and he's on a movie set somewhere doing something. I'm like, I take those bits and pieces and just write them out in like kind of a, a poem kind of. It's I'm like, like a poem. Just have, I'm like, man, Jeff, just get him to talk into his phone. Like the quality doesn't have to be quality at all. It can just be, it can be staticky. It could be anything. I just need Mike Shannon reading these words <laughs> by tomorrow. <laughs> and Jeff was like, I'll see what I can do. And uh, yeah, he called Mike. And then really like eight hours later, I got this voice memo sent just via text and it's and Mike that's on the words. album and that's what I gave it to Matt Rossbang and he put it on the and record just, it's awesome it was super cool and it does yeah. sound gritty and yeah. a lot of people thought that it was like originally people thought it was you just graveling or maybe I don't know um I think so and I was he was because he's yeah he's got that low yeah I don't know I I could instantly tell it was Mike obviously but um yeah it probably confused some folks but uh Having Mike Shannon on the album and in a video for a whole nother song. Yeah, Mike's Mike's been a good friend of the family. Uh, he's been real good to us. Very him, cool. Him saying yes to shotgun stories way back, I don't even know what year that was, early 2000s. Um, Jeff's first movie, Shotgun Stories, right out of film school. And Mike, you know, Mike was not super well known, but he was a well respected actor already, uh, especially in theater and stuff. And the fact that Someone of that caliber read Jeff's script and was like, oh, yeah, I'm in. And then after that movie, he's like, I'll do anything you want. And he's like, whatever you do, let me know. I would like to be involved. And so, yeah, Jeff and, so far, Jeff and Mike's relationship Six, super seven cool. movies later, he's in every one. Exactly. It's super cool. That's, it's something nice to see. Yeah, he's been nice to us. Very cool. Yeah. And you had a, you had a, a little uh, stint of some voiceover work. I did. I've got. I've done a couple of weird things here and there. I did some voiceover work for Jack Daniels for a little bit, which was very, like, I didn't know that you did it until I heard it. Really? And yeah. I texted you. I was like, "What the Is fuck?" That, what? <laughs> yeah, I think I'm pretty sure they had somebody. I'm sure they had somebody lined up, a real voice person lined up for this, and they backed out or something happened, and there was an emergency. And, Who can we get? And the guys that had the account at the advertising agency or whatever were like, happened to be Lucero fans. They're like, let's see if Ben can do it. And I went in and I auditioned. I'm like, all right, yep, let's do it. And yeah, it was real quick. That's that's good work if you can get it. I would love to do more of that. But um, but then the but then the Jack Daniels account changed advertising firms and, I mean, and my like, job was over every every year a new ad campaign comes in you know right. so so yeah they change it up but uh but then i did a little i mean little the, most, the most interesting man in the world he really made a run at it he, that was for a long yeah, time he had a long run i was not that interesting <laughs> <laughs> but but yeah but i did get like like that show Treme, the HBO show Treme. Never heard of it. No, it takes Treme. Place, Treme, T R E M E. Well, it's a neighborhood in New Orleans. Oh yeah, so and so it's all about musicians in New Orleans. Um, it was made. One of the writers worked on the Wire. Like it's made oh, by. Yeah. It was kind of a follow up. Uh, it had nothing to do with the Wire, but it was made by the same folks. And um, and it was it was a cool show. But they would have different bands on it all the time because it's about musicians and lucero actually got to go down and was featured in one episode of treme and then i got to have a scene with one of the actresses um and so that's the only i think people saw that and they're like okay that, we're never going to do that again with ben it's, i think ben's <laughs> acting career is over now um so i did that once i did voiceovers once yeah <laughs> i've tried numerous things that and then it's, it's nice i can say i've done it and I don't have to do it again necessarily, but yeah. Uh, but then another one of the coolest things was that Walking Dead thing, which you know, I don't know how much you know about Walking Dead. You know Norman. I know that it's it a very popular show. It was a popular show, and like in 2013, the showrunner had been listening to that Last Pill Light in the West record, that solo record, and he had apparently written a scene in the Walking Dead, kind of based around the song Last Pill Light in the West. And so he called and asked if he could use it. And I was like, hell yeah, you can use it, please. Um, and so, I mean, yeah. you're a zombie fan. 
I had watched the, I was a fan of the comic book before the show was even made. Um, one of my favorite comic book artists, uh, Tony Moore worked, worked on that. Um, and then it became a show. And so I was like, yeah, I'll watch that. And so I knew exactly when he was like, oh, it's going to be the governor's scene. Da, da, da. I knew exactly what he was talking about. I was like, oh, please. Yes. Use this song. So that was cool too. So yeah, we've, we've over the years, Lucifer, that's been the able good to work to get stuff. that, that pays a little money too. Yeah. Um, getting your songs in movie and TV it's sold. and all that kind of stuff. It was funny looking at like the iTunes, like the week after that episode aired, like I sold like, I don't know how many copies of just that song. Like you can buy a song for 99 cents or whatever on Apple. Yeah. And yeah, it was just like, brrr, and I sold, I don't a know million. how many. Not a million, <laughs> but like maybe 20,000 yeah. or something. Yeah. Pretty so good. like 20,000 times 99 cents. I'll take it. Yeah. That's pretty good. Um, I didn't get all the 99 cents because that's not gets, how streaming works. Apple gets a fair amount. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but I got some of that 99 cents. Apple gets a fair amount. Management gets a fair amount. Taxes yeah. get a fair amount. Yeah. I got $9. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, we've been real lucky and I've gotten to do some cool stuff over the years. So that's some of it. Well, as a, as a musician and recording, you know, for your band, what is there an avenue that you can or, take to try to boost getting your music into other realms or is it just the luck of the draw or is it just for us you just wait for that phone call yeah for us it's i mean i'm sure your agent your agent is trying to like put you out yeah. there as much and as you they can a, and you have a publishing company whose job it is is to push songs yeah. to productions of different kinds um but that's just such a long shot uh the i and knowing how jeff works you know jeff nichols he he he's not going to take wants. suggestions. Yeah, he's yeah. already got it in his head what he wants. Um, and like the guy from The Walking Dead, Scott Gimple, he just knew this. He wrote the scene for the song. And so, yeah, it doesn't matter what songs get uh, pitched to him. Um, so that's pitching a song. is a, it's a, That's a tough sell. Um, so, yeah, really it comes down to Lucero. Yeah, playing enough and getting out there enough and word spreading enough to where the right people happen to hear hear the stuff and then get attached to it personally and then involve it in their work. That's kind of how it's worked for us in the past. And I don't, I don't know. I, I like that method if it works, but I don't know how you, mm, I don't know how you facilitate that. I don't know how you push that. Um, the fact that it's not being pushed on people is kind of what I like actually. They're coming to us. Well, just, just to talk about soundtrack music for a second, that the soundtrack in the Bikers movie is so good. Yeah, I've and, got a, I haven't seen the final list. I know it's coming out. That's coming out on vinyl, too. Um, and I don't think the Bike Riders song, the Lucero song, won't be on the vinyl, but it'll be on the digital copies. Um, and I, Jeff was concerned about that. Jeff felt bad that it wasn't going to be on the vinyl. But it, even I was like, man... Those songs on vinyl are all period correct. Yeah, are all period correct. And I'm like, that's the right move. And then, yeah, on the streaming sites, you can stick the Lucero song, the modern, the more contemporary song on there. Um, and it'll be included enough. Um, I wonder on the, because there's like three different versions of the same song in the soundtrack. I wonder if they're going to use, just pick the one version. Or uh, for bike riders? Yeah. Is it? I think it's just the one. Is it not just the one at the end? No, no, credits? I'm talking about the other songs in the movie. There's oh. like other song in the movie. Like I think the song's like either called like On the Road or On the Go or something, but there's like three different versions of it. Oh, really? Oh, I don't know. Three different. I don't know. That's a Jeff thing. I'm not sure. But man, and the way he uses that same song in, with different versions of it in different oh, parts. Yeah, that was his, yeah, that was his idea. Uh, um, no, what's that, what's that band called? Um, Man, I'm blanking out. But yeah, uh, he wanted to deconstruct some of those classic songs. And instead of having a proper score, like with orchestral stuff, he wanted to use elements from those old pop songs. So cool. Um, so and then cool. use those as the score. So I think on the soundtrack, it'll probably just be, be the, the hit version. Songs. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it would be kind of cool. Because sometimes you buy it, you get a soundtrack to a movie and it's like. It's just the sound. It's yeah. a score and there's and that's actually awesome. the soundtrack, you know, the, yeah. not just the songs. And I like was, those too. I like those. Um, I listen to a lot of soundtrack stuff. Um, scores. Scores, yeah. Like, because on a lot of his past films, he worked with a guy named David Wingo and he's great at that. I've always thought Jeff's scores were really good. 
Um, but this one, this soundtrack, this will probably be more just like a, like a compilation tape. Like, yeah, it'll be the old hits. Yeah, I thought that the soundtrack was, was his. He did good. Very, very important to the impact of the film. I thought For sure. So good. And I thought he picked well. And um, my favorite movie makers always have great soundtracks. The Coen Brothers and Wes Anderson. The soundtracks are always just for sure. No, it the can best. It can become a obviously it's a huge part of the movies. Um, and yeah, those guys have their own kind of signature sounds almost. Um, so yeah. But when you when you make a period piece movie, you're you kind of you're kind of I don't know if pigeonhole is the right word, but you you want to play stuff that's a time appropriate. Well, yeah, of course. Yeah. So I think it's cool the way he did the score. It's like, it is the sound of the era. Yeah. And I thought, I mean, and you've got a lot of great music to pick from. Um, he could have gone a number of different directions. And uh, I actually made him like a little playlist of stuff that I thought would be cool from that era. And he didn't. I don't think he chose any of it, actually. Um, he, <laughs> he always has a very... He has a very... Whatever, Ben. Yeah, he's like, oh, thanks. Yeah, whatever. Um, he has a very, uh, you know, keen vision. He knows exactly what he wants. Um, and yeah, so nobody's pitching him anything. Not even me, usually. Um, but I I do think what he ended up with was a cool soundtrack, for sure. Man, <laughs> so good, so good. I wish... I mean, you've had a few of your songs in the credits. Of Jeff's movies, of yeah. Jeff's movies, yeah, and some in the films too. Like in uh, as part of Shelter. the soundtrack, yeah. Um, that song is the first one I wrote specifically for one of his films, uh, and I can't remember the, the movie's called Take Shelter, and I think the song might just be called Shelter. I always get them confused, um, but that song came out real nice. I like playing that. Did I play that the other night with Rick? I can't remember. Oh wait, I might have. I can't remember. It was on the list, but I don't know if we actually got to it or not. I think we did. You played Loving. Did I play Loving? That's another one. That's one of my favorites that I've written for Jeff. Um, but was that in the movie movie or just that in the was credits? A, in the credits again. Uh, that, You're again, the credit a, guy. That was a period piece too. Yeah. And so. Did the royalties on the music of the credits play as much as the royalties of the music inside the movie? I think they do. Uh, in but fact, you don't get any of it because it's your brother. and He, he pays me a flat fee. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um but yeah, I'm not sure how all that works. He keeps me in the dark pretty much about all that. Just he's like, just take this money and let me use the song. But no, they treat me all right. Very generous. They were very generous. Yeah, it's I very generous. Art, I did some artwork for him, and he was very generous with the deal. That's awesome. I, no. I was literally. He's like, "What do you want for this?" I was like, "Whatever you want to do." And exactly. I just no, it's I, cool. It goes great. No, and it's it's nice that he you know keeps including me and. In, yeah, I've got, it's like Mike Shannon. I've got a little something in, in every movie. Yeah. Which is super cool. You and Mike Shannon. Tight. Yeah. We're, well, we're not, I, I don't know. We're just both <laughs> always involved in a Jeff Nichols production. Yeah. There's always going to be a little bit of Mike Shannon and a little bit of me in the, in the, in the mix. Well, I, as far as one more topic about the, the Bike Riders movie, I don't know uh, how much actual, this actually played out. But when the movie was getting made, I was like, you got to get, I told Jeff, you got to get Norman Reedus in the movie because he's a motorcycle rider. Right. And yeah. then I told Norman Reedus, hey, dude, you got to get in this movie because they're making a movie. So that was you, huh? About. You made that happen? I don't know. <laughs> I'm not claiming that I made it happen. But I definitely was like, you got to get him in the movie. He's a motorcycle rider. And I definitely right. told Norman, you got to get your people to contact, blah, 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 blah. And he ended up getting in the movie. It was great. It was great. Yeah. I don't know how that happened either, exactly. Um, but yeah, that might have been, it might have been all all you suggesting it. I wouldn't um, say it's all me. Nothing. But uh, but it was cool. I thought he was great as Funny Sonny. I thought that was really cool. Um, and I like that he didn't want to look like Daryl from Walking Dead. He wanted to look totally different. And yeah, I respected that. I thought that was a good move. Well, I thought it was cool to get Tom Hardy in there because he actually rides motorcycles. Yeah. He rides badass. Yeah, he rides too. Uh, Toby, I don't think Toby previously rode motorcycles, right. but he rode the shit out of those motorcycles. <laughs> he seems like a guy that's probably not scared he, he of anything. Gung -ho. He's like, I'll hop on and ride. He that. was he. You know, they gave actors the option, like, do you want to ride for real? Do you want to have stunt double? You know, it's all this ins and outs. That you know, obviously, they're seeing you want the actors on the bike so it looks, of course, better instead of a process trailer or whatever. Sure. You know, Toby. There's a few actors that were gung ho. 
you know, Carl Gooseman and Toby and those guys. And they, right. they were riding every day before filming and getting ready. And Toby crashed this motorcycle into a tree. Really? On pre <laughs> like the couple days before. And, and you, everybody's freaking out. You supplied a bunch of those motorcycles, and, and right? Toby was like, get me back on. Let's get and like he was ready to start riding. Right back again. on that horse. Huh? Oh yeah. <laughs> right back in the zone. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, a, good. Bunch of, a bunch of eleven of the bikes were mine. Eleven. All right. And uh um, and how many bikes did, did they have total? I don't know. Like Close to 50. Wow. Man, that's a lot of motorcycles. That's awesome. 50 a antique, lot of period correct motorcycles. 50 antique motorcycles. That's and nice. what I'll say is we were talking about it, and this movie has more antique motorcycles running in the movie than I think any other movie in the history of time. That's pretty cool. Because the older movies, like that are the popular older motorcycle movies, Sure. Didn't have this many motorcycles and the motorcycles weren't as old. Sure. Yeah. You I know, mean, when they, they were film, made... when they filmed the Loveless, those bikes were 10, 10 or 12 years old. Right. I mean, those... these bikes are all 50 plus years old. And Loveless only had six or five seven bikes. motorcycles. Yeah. Something it, yeah. like that. And Streets I mean, of Fire right. has a bunch of motorcycles, right. but they were probably only 10 or 15 years old at the time. And the original and, Mad Max had a ton of motorcycles. But they're all dirt but they're bikes. All, they're all brand new Kawasaki's. Yeah. They're brand new in 1976 or whatever. Yes. 77. Um, so, yeah, they're not old motorcycles. So, I mean, and it's it's such an undertaking. And literally, you know, talking to Jeff Nichols, he's like, oh, yeah, never want to do a movie with antique motorcycles. <laughs> he's, he's, he's a pain in the ass. Can check that box off. He's, <laughs> he's got that covered. Yeah. People, they, I mean, the people, the, the production people didn't understand because they're ready. No. They're like, okay, we're here with the cameras. We're rolling. Go. Here. And then you want 12 antique motorcycles to start up and start going. Right. That ain't always how it works. No, no. And, now, and, and yeah, and people that don't know those kind of motorcycles just don't understand. They're like, yeah, just bring them in. And you're like, well, well, if we can, all right, start them up. Well, you can't just, you don't just push a button. Right, no, no. And not, and there's only three people. There's like, there's like clothes pins involved and there's, some chokes involved. But there's three, and you gotta, there you was, punch this button. Five, there was three people. Three pumps and then switch this and then another pump. And then, yeah, <laughs> I don't know. There was three people on set that could start the motorcycles. 50 motorcycles, three people that can start them. <laughs> You're not having all the bikes start at one time. But there's no scene where all 50 are going. Right. So anyway, but still. How many, like when they're coming over the bridge? There's probably 20, 20, bikes 20 there. plus bikes in there. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, you got to start three at a time <laughs> until you get 20 bikes. <laughs> yeah. No, pretty that, exciting. What, all, what everybody on that production did and what Jeff did, uh, just getting it all together and all finished that's it's it's a lot of work and it's really impressive i'm 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 impressed by everybody that was involved well if that. you didn't see the movie in the theater you missed out but still a great movie yeah for sure it, there's a, the sound production was an, a whole nother character all on its own you know the, it, it brought something to it the rumor is is that if it's up for an award it might have a limited re-engagement into a theater I, I don't know. So Maybe your so chances, that'd be great. Your chance yeah. to see it at a theater might come back around. That'd be cool. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. It it might be in a f handful of theaters still, but it's slowly working its way to just streaming. Um, but it might still be out there somewhere. Um, but if, but it'd would, be cool if it got a re-release around award season. I would say that it's got to be up for some award. That's a world I don't know anything about. There, I mean, just even just the cinematography. Yeah, and, Adam Stone, the cinematographer. He's uh, great. He's been on all Jeff's movies, too. All the stuff in that movie, there's got to be at least one award that they get it, at least a nomination is something. I hope so. I hope so. That would be that would be huge. Just, yeah, just a nomination is, yeah, is pretty cool. Um, so, yeah, we'll keep our fingers crossed. Yeah. So your chance to see it in the movie theater might come back around. That'd be great. We, uh... Moving out of the movie world. Yeah. Lucero is slated to re record a new record when? Man, well, that's the thing. I've got the unplugged record with Rick, and then I've got this solo project that I want to do. Uh, and then it'll be time to do another Lucero record. Um, so next year. Next year. We've got a big fall tour uh, out west, the western half of the country with the Vandaliers, a Texas band that we love. 
Um, and so in November, we'll be out west. Uh, and then we've got some holiday stuff. We might do a New Year's show. Um, and then, yeah, I, I don't know. Where, where are you talking about this New Year's show at? I'm not sure. It hasn't been announced yet. Um, <laughs> I don't know. It might be, it, that would be in the middle of the country somewhere. Would it be in a multiple night in a row kind of thing? or just Yeah, maybe a few and... nights in a row, two nights in a row, three nights in a row, something. Um, up north, of course. Can't do it someplace warm. Just because that's our style. <laughs> Some place really cold. And, really cold. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we'll see. Uh, that, I don't think. Well, that, you're living up in the wind. You're living up in the north. My wife is a Yankee. My wife's from up north, and my daughter is from up north. And she's a like she loves coming to Texas to visit. But she doesn't like the heat. She's like it's hot. She doesn't like it. I mean, it gets warm up in Ohio, but it don't get Texas hot. No, not at all. In the summers, like you can go outside in the summertime in Ohio. It's tough to go outside in Texas in the summertime. Like up there, like at night, it's like 86 degrees and it's it's humid, but not that humid. And like, you're like, oh, yeah, you can go out and enjoy a summer evening. And you get not, snow. And what? And you get snow. And you get snow, which is fun too. And because, you know, like Arkansas is tricky where I'm from because you'll get snow, but nobody deals with snow well. It's or you get fun. ice. It's not fun. It's snow. not fun snow, and you're stuck, and everything's closed, and everything sucks. I mean, you might get out of school for a few days, but it it throws everything off. But in Ohio, it snows. It's ass off, but everybody deals with it, and life goes on. And then you can, yeah, you can go sled, or you can do whatever you want. It's fun. Um, so yeah, I don't mind it up there. No, it's and we live in the middle of nowhere, and nobody really knows me up there. And I don't. I just it's just me and the family when I'm there, and that's kind of what I like. Yeah, you got a sweet setup. It's I love that property yeah it's good um and yeah and, and all my girls are there grandma's down the street yep bachan um yeah the japanese mother-in-law not too long not too far down the street um so yeah it's it's good it's good I, i'm i'm sad that i'm so far away from my parents and from my brothers but yeah every, you travel a lot though yeah we i see them enough well not enough but i see them as much as i can so so yeah we we stay in touch with that our family's still real close. Um, but yeah, for right now, yeah, we're up north. So your parents going to stay? They just going to stay in Little Rock till the end of time? They live in the same house I was brought home to when I was born. Like, they bought that house the year before I was born. And so that's the only home I've ever known. Um, which is it Sounds kinda, like a line from a song. It does. <laughs> it's kind of crazy. Nobody's, like, I don't have any friends whose parents, are, A, are usually still together. And B, still live in the exact same house that they've always lived in. And they thought about, like, when we were kids, they went shopping. And we're house, we were always house shopping the whole time I grew up. <laughs> and they never found they one. never found one. No. <laughs> and if, like, they were like, because my brothers shared a room. I got a room to myself because I was the oldest. And then my Matt and Jeff shared a room. And so they were always like, well, maybe we can get a house with another bedroom. Um, What's but, the age gap? I'm four years older than Matt and five years older than Jeff. Oh, they're close. They're yeah, they're like a year apart almost. And um, and I'm three or four years older. It's something like that. Three or four or four or five. Uh, so they shared a room until I moved out when I was seventeen, and then I never went back. So then they got their own rooms. But um, but yeah, if but now you know if my parents had bought a bigger house, now with the family spread out and them getting older, they'd actually be shopping for a house just like they're in. They'd be trying to downsize now since they're older. So really, it all worked out. And I love going back to that house that I grew up in. There's just a lot of memories. Yeah, it's so weird. My parents, my mom and stepfather moved out of the house, my childhood house from the age of probably 10 till I graduated high school. And right. They moved out, and it was it was a weird thing. I, it, I can, it's going to be an emotional event when that house it's no doesn't longer. belong to our family anymore. And one day that'll happen. And then I won't have any ties to Little Rock anymore, which will be. Except for the Whitewater Tavern. I've, the Whitewater Tavern will be my home in, in yes. Little Rock, Arkansas. You can sleep there. I think they're going to give me a key. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have a key already? I know. You we, don't know how to sneak in the back door? We were sound We were sound checking and they had the door locked, the front door locked. And I think maybe Audra showed up or something. Let's to, go around back. To bring in the merch. And I went up to the front door and the key wasn't in the door to unlock it. I was going to unlock it for Audra. And I was like, oh, Matt, I don't have, do you have a key? He's like, you don't have one already? I'm like, not yet. We need to fix that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How many times you played the Whitewater Tavern? Ooh, I don't know. 
lots. A, a bunch, a bunch. And then, I mean, you're the then one. I've hung out at the Whitewater Tavern yeah. a bazillion times. Yeah. I love that place. It's my favorite. It's still my favorite venue. I literally asked when, when you were playing the other night at Joe's at the soundboard, and I was like, man, why does it sound so good in here? It does sound real good in and there. And he's just like, it's just. It's it all is, wood. It is what it is. You yeah. Know I mean, it just. Nah, it's all wood and it's just, yeah, well seasoned. <laughs> yeah. I think they, did, I mean, it was sold out show, but they didn't sell too many. No. Nah, it was comfortable in there. Yeah. It was a great a crowd. They keep it at like 150, maybe 175 at the most. It was great. Um, and yeah, and it's perfect. You can still get to the bar and get a drink. Um, people can still move around, but it feels good. Um, and yeah, it's just, it's got that old, it's, how long it's has a roadhouse, you know, I think since the early seventies, 72, maybe, um, or 76, somewhere around there. Um, and yeah, I, I met goose who ran it forever and he's the one that kind of got Matt white and the other kids involved and kind of presided over that transition to like the new generation. And so I was there a lot when they were kind of taking over. And I think me and Corey might have played their first night. Oh, yeah, I'm pretty sure February of '08 or sometime around then. Man, I'm, yeah, I'm pretty. We might have been the first Whitewater show with the new ownership. Yeah. Well, you uh, you took me there or had me meet you there a long time ago when we were oh, yeah? very first uh, acquainted, and John Snodgrass was there. Was he playing? Yeah. Oh wow! Hell yeah! And uh. It was, I was, I fell in love with the place. Yeah, it's a cool spot. And I fell in love with John Snodgrass too. He's a, he's a, he's a buddy. Yeah. I don't know if we're going to see him in Colorado or not. I don't know. We're not going to Fort Collins. We're not going to Fort Collins. And I think he might be out of, when we're in there. He might be on, who knows? He could be on the road. Um, but yeah, I saw him last time we were in Fort Collins and it was great. It's always good seeing John. He actually opened for us last time Lucero was there. So, so yeah. Um, now nah, Whitewater has always been my favorite. Um, so yeah, it was a great place to start this bike riders run. Great place to have a birthday party. Perfect. Perfect. I'm glad you did two nights. It yeah. It worked out great. Uh, me too. Me too. I was planning on only doing one, but yeah, it sold out quick. So, so for was, coming up, necessary. coming up, we got nine more days of bike riders coming up. Do you know everybody who's opening throughout the deal or some not of the just local one. people you don't know? Yeah, no, not on this one. This time I was like, ah, I'll just let the promoters, you know, suggest a local person that they think might be good. And so, so yeah, you never know. Um, I, I have a feeling most folks will be great. Um, but yeah, I might discover, we might discover our new favorite person. Who knows? Yeah. It's um, exciting. Tonight you got Isaiah. Tonight, old friend Isaiah from Dallas is playing a solo acoustic at Club Dada with me. And um, so yeah, that'll be cool. That'll be just old buddies playing some songs together. Oh man. He... It's one of those people that doesn't like to play solo, solo that much. I know. I'm kind of making him. I think it's great. I, it's going to be awesome. No, it's going to be it's going to be great. But I but he's he likes the distortion and the. You well, know. last time, I think he had John, his guitar player, play with him. The last that'd be time. great. He might maybe he maybe he'll bring John too. I don't know. Who knows? Who knows? We'll see what we get. But it'll be fun no matter what. Yeah. Well, there's a change in the guard for this year's bike riders tour. You got a new motorcycle. Nobody knows that yet. I guess they will maybe by the time this comes out. But um, but yeah, I've been riding 07 1200 GS since the very first bike riders tour, and it's just starting to show its age a little bit. It's got about <laughs> it's got about seventy thousand miles on it, and it'll still run forever. But it didn't have cruise control. It didn't have it. There were some there were some uh, modern conveniences that I liked about the newer bikes, um, and it was time to upgrade. And I found a great bike actually down in Austin, a used bike. And um, so, yeah, at the last minute, I kind of invested. I mean, you got your money's worth out of that 07. I did. I got a, a lot of miles on it. And uh, yeah, what, 10 bike riders tours, like you said, something like that. Um, so, yeah, it worked great. And it was, yeah, what a great deal on that bike. I bought it in 09 for like 10 grand. Um, and then, yeah, rode it for 10 years. <laughs> so, yeah, now changing to the guard, like you said, a new... 1250 GS, 2019. So yeah, hopefully- Beautiful, beautiful uh, motorcycle. Man, it's gorgeous. I'm Me and you got excited. the red, white, and blue matching paint schemes now. That's right. Oliver's Harley is is white with 
red and blue stripes. And uh, yeah, the BMW is now white with red and blue accents too. So yeah, I'm, we're. I'm glad you jumped on that train, Esco. I, we. You're like, you're going to love this paint scheme. <laughs> I know. I know how you feel about your Harley guy. And I was like, well, I got a new bike. Yeah. Uh, and at least you're going to like the paint scheme. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a BMW guy. It's what I, the guy that taught me how to ride motorcycles, um, like in 05, he was riding a BMW. And I'd always just like those old airheads, just when I didn't even know anything about them. And then I happened to learn how to ride on a K bike. And so the first thing I bought was an old BMW airhead. And then I've just been, I've just been a fan of theirs since then. And um, so, yeah, I'm sticking with what I know. And I got a new BMW. And uh, no, we make a good pair. Everything's it's fine. Gonna, it's going to be great. It's going to be great. It's going to be great. Well, so the double album with Rick Steff comes out. The Unplugged record, right. Comes out when? I'm hoping it comes out this fall. Um, I'm trying to wrap up that deal and get all the paperwork done and get it mastered into the pressing plant. Got and, a heavy uh, duty negotiation to go on with Rick Steff and his lawyers and all that. <laughs> no, Rick's pretty easy. <laughs> Rick's pretty easy. Rick's glad to be involved and I'm glad he did it. Um, and yeah, it's just the two of us. So it's really actually pretty easy. It's, it's it was figuring all, out. We were talking about, it, it's all recorded live. Like yeah. one, like most, like very few takes live. You and Rick, same time, grand piano, acoustic guitar. Yeah. We went into the studio and just knocked out 24 songs in one day and then, uh, mixed them the next day, kind of with Matt Ross Bang. And then that weekend we went up, there's a little venue, uh, Matt Ross Bang's studio is in Crosstown Concourse. This Big, the building was huge, a Sears building. It had been abandoned forever. And then it got redone into, it's got everything in it. Condos. It's got everything in it. It's got a radio station. It's got a high school in it. It's got restaurants. It's got a recording studio. And it's got this little venue. So we went to the little venue, the green room, and Matt recorded a live show. So there's going to be some live tracks as maybe bonus material too. But, um, but yeah, we did the main record all in one day. We did a couple of takes of a few songs, but a lot of those songs are just one take. Um, and we just set up and just played grand piano, acoustic guitar, and vocals, and kept it real simple, and uh, not a lot of effects or anything. You know, a little reverb here, a little stuff to make it the room sound nice, but that room sounds great all on its own. So yeah, it's just a real natural kind of recording of some old school Lucero songs with real pretty piano parts. And like I, I said this yesterday, I think this, this might be uh, some Luf Lucero fans' favorite record now. Man, it comes I, out. it's such a beautiful sound. It's a... It's a great thing to add to our catalog. And yeah, I think I think some old school fans will really dig it just because you you really get to hear that piano. But then I think maybe, maybe possibly it'll bring some new folks on board that, you know, just because it's uh, it's just a nice sounding kind of it's a more low key, quiet, very listenable record. So it might bring some folks that are more, you know, they like more standard country acoustic type stuff. Maybe it brings some new fans in. We'll see. I don't know. I, I'm I'm real proud of it. I like it. So you're talking about got a, got a tour coming up with Vandaliers. Yeah, that'll be fun as hell. Those guys, those guys are young, they're rowdy and energetic. They're rowdy friends. <laughs> Have not settled down. They yet. are still the rowdy friends. <laughs> they are the rowdy friends. Yeah. So we're bringing our own rowdy friends on this next run. Um, yeah, they're gonna make us look old, but I'm fine with that. It's gonna be so much fun. I'm. Oh, it's going to be a blast. Uh, so, yeah, you'll have the Vandaliers just tearing the room apart. And then you'll have Lucero just doing what Lucero does, playing some solid quality material, hopefully. Um, but, yeah, the Vandaliers are going to blow the roof off the joint. Who else are you uh, looking to tour with in the next couple cycles? Man, uh, that's a good question. I don't actually know. Um, the you, said, you said you had a couple shows with Turnbike. Well, well, yeah, and I don't know if those have been announced yet, but – They've been real nice allowing us to open up a few shows here and there. We played with them, I don't know, three or four times so far. And those are huge shows. Turnpike Troubadours is just kicking butt. Um, so they're playing to thousands and thousands of people a night. And they've been very nice uh, about offering some opening slots to bands, you know, that they knew from the old days. And we played with them in the past. Uh, and we'd opened for them before and they'd opened for us. We played their thing in Tahlequah and they'd come and they played the block party in Memphis one year um opening for us and it's gone back and forth but now they're just huge and so the fact that they uh yeah they still remember us and let us invite us out it's a uh, it's it's a very nice it's a nice compliment just to get invited so so yeah we might do a couple more shows with them if if that opportunity arises um 
And then, yeah, if, uh, we'll see. I, I can't remember what else is, there's other stuff in the pipeline, but uh, yeah, we'll have to see what actually, you never know what's going to fall apart and what's actually going to solidify. And, uh, but I'm, we'll keep busy in the next year for sure. Well, in general, do you rather, would you, I mean, obviously taking the, the money out of the equation and out of the, and of the touring aspect, because obviously when you're the headliner, you're making more money. Sure. Um, do you enjoy the opening set? Right. More because it's, it's quicker and easier or no. do you rather? No, nah, I prefer being the headliner when it comes down to it. We just got so many songs so and when, I'm, when I really you, like playing the songs. So like when it's an opening slide, it's just not, it's not enough. Yeah. Um, I've got more that I want to say. Um, so yeah, I enjoy being the headliner. Uh, so it's harder to commit to a long term, like a like multi month opening tour. Right. Like that's a hard commitment to do, right? And we just did that with the Menzingers. Um and and it was cool. And I'm hoping they've got a younger crowd. And I'm hoping maybe we were a tough sell to a young crowd. Um, but I'm hoping we won a few of them over. Um Well, when you open for the Menzingers, do you I mean, obviously, you play that crowd. You play the more upbeat. You play the Usually, fast stuff. You try to get rowdy. You yeah, to, but then yeah. you throw in a couple to kind of knock them off balance, and you'll do "I'll Just Fall," or even a New Orleans, or or it gets the worst at night. Maybe some slower songs that you hope have kind of an emotional impact um, that they might not be expecting, and they they're definitely not slam dancing to it. But you you hope to get their attention. Um, and maybe they'll remember that and maybe they'll look it up when they get home and then who knows, maybe they'll become Lucero fans too. So, um, the Menzingers were great. They were just, they were great every night and they they're were super high, friendly. They're pretty high energy too. They're super high energy. Yeah. Um, and we had the dirty nil opening. It was a three band bill and the dirty nil is very high energy and really loud. Just like, yeah. And so we were the, we were the dip <laughs> in the middle, but, uh, yeah. How long was, was that tour? It was long. It's like, well, it was about four weeks, but we'd already been on tour for like two and a half weeks before that started. So we did like a seven week tour, eight week tour, which is long for us now. Um, but it was good. And yeah, I think it was good for us. And then I'm still to this day, I meet folks like the biggest thing we ever did like that. We opened for social distortion for that was a, long run. a couple months. Yeah. Um, maybe like a couple months here and then another month down the road so we did a long time with social distortion and those could be tough shows just because you know the crowd's the there to see social fan distortion want social distortion they yeah. want it so bad um and but still like a good portion of our crowd the first time they ever saw us was at social distortion shows um and yeah flock and molly's been nice we've been out with them a well i think of times. social distortion is pretty good it get it mike's always been good at picking openers yeah and well he takes music that he yeah, likes that um, and the fact that he liked us, I thought was, I didn't see that coming. Um, but he was, he happened to be a big fan of ours and, uh, that was super cool. And that kept me going in the tough moments on stage, opening up. I knew that at least Mike, Mike's watching usually, um, a lot of nights at least. And that was a great tour. Yeah. That was a really good The tour. leg that I was on was Chad and John. Oh, wow. Really? Chad and John. From Drag the River, Chad and John? Yeah. Yeah. They and they were, they open. Then you. Then that's a good. Distortion. That's a real nice lineup. And Chad and John were driving that little tiny little two seat two door car. That's right. And they that's were right. late every day. <laughs> that sounds about right. That sounds about right. And they, one night they were too. They were too, too. Both of them were too drunk to drive. Yeah. So they. This was. We were all. There was a. I mean, social distortion was sober. But all the opening acts oh, were pretty. Yeah. Uh, oh yeah, we were still. I had to still, drive their car. It was the rowdy days. I had to drive them. That sounds right. Yeah, oh, that was amazing. <laughs> Chad's doing good. I saw Chad not too long ago. Oh, he's awesome, man. Yeah, I played a show with him in California not too long, not too long ago. I haven't seen him in a while, but I, I, I step on the. He's got short hair now. On the virtual. Yeah, he's doing good. On the internet. All right. Yeah. No. And John, like I said, John just opened for us in Fort Collins. So yeah. But they the haven't played Rivers together in a little while. I don't. Think. No, I think they're doing their own thing now. Yeah. Drag um, River is I mean I love one of my Yeah. Yep. They were one of the ones, yeah, we toured a lot with them in the old days. Um so yeah. But those two characters in a small little car together, trying to make it from city to city, <laughs> uh insane. <laughs> that 
in, it can be a fly it's amazing a, they made it, dude. It's amazing they made it. Uh, yes. And I'm, like I said earlier, uh, I'm just glad we're still, we're all still here. <laughs> Most of us are still here. And just, I'm glad, yeah, we still get to do this. Um, cause it's kind of amazing. I'm kind of surprised that we've made it this far. Um, and yeah, I'm glad those guys are still here too. Well, you guys have done a pretty good job at, at getting opener bands that fit. Yeah. That you like. And me as a Lucero fan, you know, I look forward to seeing who you, who yeah. you're going to have open. Well, yeah. At the birthday show, I got Thomas Dolbaum to open up. Never heard of him. Yeah. He was awesome. He was great. Um, a kid from, he lives in New Orleans now. And, um, a friend of mine had sent me his album. I think he's just got the one record right now. And um, On vinyl. You I'm, can buy it on vinyl. I'm sure you can. And um, I, I just, he sent me, you know, technology nowadays, he just texted me the album and I clicked the link and I listened to it and it became one of my favorite records. I've been listening to it every day for the last year. And so I was like, ooh, for my birthday, I'm going to get this guy that I've never seen before. Oh, that's come cool. Up. So you so hadn't met him. I hadn't, I hadn't met him. I didn't know him. I didn't talk to him until that day. Whoa. Yeah. I just... Like you I heard had, his music. Yeah, I heard his music. And I was like, ooh, that's I wanna I wanna hang out and listen to that on my birthday. And so he was nice enough to come up and play and it was it was great. It so, was yeah. really I mean beautiful. Yeah, he was really good. So yeah, we've been lucky to play with all sorts of great folks over the years. And um but yeah, that's been one of the best parts about Lucero. I've learned about a lot of music from seeing Me too. <laughs> from seeing bands open for you. Yeah. Jay Roddy. Oh, so fun. That, he, that's rock and roll. Oh. Yeah. And uh Shovels and Rope is one of my favorites, and they're still out there. We played a bunch of shows with them. Black Joe Lewis. Deer Tick. John Moreland. Oh, like, uh, and then, of course, Corey Brandon's been with us forever. So, yeah. No, it's – and I'm forgetting a ton of other great bands that we've played shows with. But, um, yeah, that's been one of the best things about this career is getting to run into all those folks, getting to know great musicians and get to see them play. Um, so, yeah, I can't complain. Do you have any 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 eyes on any young bands openers for the future? Man, I don't know. That Thomas Dolbaum, he was one that I wanted. Uh, it's tough finding new bands sometimes. Um, so I'm not sure. I'll let you know. I'd like to see him with the full band because the album. I only he does listened have to a, a band. few songs. Only listened to a few songs yesterday yeah, on the album. The and, and man, the the full band sound is killer. But it'd I be mean, cool to see him with a full band too. Um, I know there's folks, uh, I should have prepared that answer. I know there's other guys I've been listening to, other other people out there, but of course I'm blanking out on it right now when you ask. But um, no, there's definitely young kids doing really cool stuff. And it's just up to us old men to make how ourselves much, aware of it. How much does uh, management have to do with suggesting bands? Oh, the uh, you know, it's kind of 50-50. Um, sometimes... Um, yeah, sometimes it comes from management and they, and you're like, oh yeah, that's really good. And then sometimes it's Brian Venables discovered, you know, this younger band that he likes. Um, so yeah, it can, it comes from anywhere. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and when it's good, it's cool. You ever have to say like, no. Sure. Um, they're not going to work out. Yeah. And sometimes, <laughs> and sometimes management will really be pushing something, but it might be just a little too kind of Nashville standard country for me or a little too bro country yeah. and i'm like ah man i understand they're gonna sell a lot of tickets or they're but it's just it's just too uh, it's just too much for me yeah. and so yeah i've had to say no well, i mean if, if they sell too mistake, many tickets then it's their you're show. not the headliner anymore <laughs> no and that's <laughs> that can be brutal yeah everybody watches them and, and then like, the crowd leaves yeah when you should have been the opener that's yeah I've and been, you're not that's rough i've been to some concerts where we've played them people we've done them. people leave after the opening act because yeah. like, that's who they came to see yep and so you try to avoid that um but yeah well we've 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 managed it pretty good lately yeah um but yeah we'll see i'm not sure what 2025 is going to bring uh we'll do another block party i don't think we did a block party in 24 we tried and the venue fell through. Something happened at the last minute. Is Minglewood Hall not still the thing? It's it's in transition. Um, like construction we'll, or management or management and stuff. We'll probably go back there eventually. I would I would think. Um, I mean, what other place in Memphis is great for that kind of setup? I'm not sure. There's a couple of breweries now that are oh. have some bigger spaces, but they're new, and I'm not sure. 
So who knows? Uh, we'll see. We'll figure something out. We didn't. We couldn't pull it together this year. We had some great bands lined up. Uh, a couple of Texas bands actually lined up. Uh, I'll keep that on the that we might we might bring them early next year. Whenever like if we can get Block Party together for twenty five, we might do the same lineup. We'll see. Well, I'm excited about it. We are pushing for this Lucero family camp out weekend ah, we in got Texas. To. Yeah, that'd be great. Nobody knows about that yet, but nope. that is the, to add to the Lucero the family playbook. Yeah. Yellow Rose Canyon would be a great place to do it. Other than, night other than out. the, other than the block party, you have a multiple night camp yeah. out. Yeah. You do it all. You do one in the spring, one in the fall. Yeah. We can do that. So now that people are hearing about it now, we're going to make it happen. We have to make it happen. <laughs> I'm in. I'm Hell in. Hell yeah. I've always been in. Yeah. But well, now, yeah. This will twist management's arm a little bit, maybe. Well, cool. Well, we're going to thank you again for being here. Man, my pleasure. It was fun. And I'm excited for Bike Riders Tour. Yeah. And uh, we are are actually, right now, we're going to twist your arm a little bit to play a song or two. Oh, all right, So y'all yeah. can stick around or click the link after this and uh, see a little bit of Live Ben Nichols. Have you ever had anybody? Have you had a musician do some music? Yes, sir. With the podcast before? All yes, right. Well, sir. hell yeah. Well, yeah. I'm up for that. Let's so do it'd it. Be cool. Yeah, a couple songs. We'll see what you get. And uh, thanks everybody chiming in. Comment, like, share, check it out. Follow the links. We'll have links to all the Lucero and Ben Nichols shit on here too, so y'all can check it all out. Hell yeah, man! Thanks for having me on. Thanks, buddy. Cheers. Hey, hey! Please remember to like share and subscribe come on guys click all those links push all those buttons because it really helps us out and gets us out there to more and more peaks what in the duck podcast is produced by audra cabral and john.com niederborn our sound video engineer and editor is courtney junior larkins initial audio video setup and intro music by blake balake pinchon and a big thanks to everyone that submitted questions Y'all keep them coming. Email me any questions you would like me to answer to whatintheduckpodcast at gmail.com. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time on What in the Duck. What in the Duck podcast is proud to be sponsored by Label Solutions, www.labelsolutionsinc.com. I've been a customer of theirs for over a decade. They make the highest quality premium labels for all kinds of products. Food and beverage, personal care products, pet care products, beer and wine spirits, CBD products, automotive products, and more. They can make a label for almost anything. Multicolor, custom die cut, full wraparound labels, too many options to even tell you about. I use label solutions for all the stickers and labels for my stuff, like the Tiki Loco label on the coffee I'm drinking right now. They do have a minimum order of 1,000 labels, so they won't make you 20 labels for that soap you're making in your bathtub. But if you've got products to label, you need Label Solutions. Get started today at www.labelsolutionsinc.com.